Tradune. Ontogeny.
we now recognize that birds are dinosaurs, what I study is the long, deep evolution of birds from Mesozoic dinosaurs. The very concept is unimaginable. Why, if that happened, we wouldn't have a chance. How could we possibly hope to fight them? We couldn't, you're right. You're right, Mrs. Bundy. Hurry up, children, finish your lunch. Are the birds going to eat us, Mommy? Birds have been on this planet since Archaeopteryx, 140 million years ago. Doesn't it seem odd that they'd wait all that time to start a, a war? Who said anything about a war? All I said is... Troodon probably fed on our ancestors, the early mammals. It is the most intelligent, adaptable, and successful hunter on the planet. You gotta check your mirrors, just side of your eye. Side of your eye. Well, hello, hello, everybody. And welcome back to Paleontologizing. It is so good to see you here today. I'm glad you could make it. And I'm just realizing I gotta... Man, I change shirts and suddenly the, uh... The camera goes completely haywire. I'm all washed out right now. We'll fix this in a minute, but for the time being, welcome to Paleontologizing. I'm so glad you're here. All you regulars, and uh, also if there's anybody new. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Got a new camera angle set up. Still working on this. It's a work in progress. But uh, after having moved to the new office... We're here today oh. because... By the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. It's true, Wabat Hole. Yes, indeed, Wombat Hole. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Paleontologizing, everybody. If anybody's here for the very first time, thank you for being here. Let me introduce myself. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a, a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. That's me, although I work on dinosaur fossils in particular most of the time. 
know a thing or two about other fossil groups also, but dinosaurs are actually what I publish on, what I study, what I dig up during the summers in places like Utah and Wyoming, like I was doing this past summer. Here's some objects, gorgeous and Rothgar... And authentic. Because though they died out so long ago, their fossil <laughs> bones remain, so we know just what they were like and can even sculpt them into still, or rather, extinct life. There you go. Yeah. The new camera angle isn't it of a second twitch baby. We How? Work adjusting to a camera angle. Good. I'm glad, Rafgar. Um <laughs> Thank you so much for the 18 months of support. I really appreciate that. Holy cow. And uh Wombat Hole, I really appreciate your 11 months as well. Thank you so much both of you for helping keep me on the air for that long. As a person who does this full time, you could call me the world's first full-time live streaming paleontologist and you'd be correct uh, feeling a bit cheated, try thank you for guys. making that possible you know thank you for those 100 bits hogan holy cow we've got a hype train started here be beautiful i'm happy about that give me just a second here let's adjust this camera real quick um yeah here we go figure video Let's turn our brightness down a little bit and our contrast down a little bit too. Let's see if that helps. Uh, not really. Um, maybe I just turn these lights down a little bit. That's already a little bit better. We'll see if that improves things somewhat. I still feel a little bit washed out. Give me a second here. Arranging things on the fly. This is how you can tell that this is a live broadcast here. Let's work on our key light a little bit. And holy cow, Acrocanthosaurus. Welcome, welcome back to Paleontologizing. Thank you, thank you, Acrocanthosaurus. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. I've been having a great time here so far. Very grateful to have this space. And, uh... It's not connecting. Hmm. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. It's taken a bit of adjusting, but... And we're still doing that adjusting. But I'm very happy to be here. And, uh, check out the... New items that we have in the background today. The idea is that we've got different background every day so yeah and holy cow Reganation five gift subs there hang on a minute why is the alert not coming up uh Patrick Pirate 35 months from you holy cow and also our soundboard isn't working Utah Raptor is the most dangerous there we go oh new digs Yes, indeed, Patch. Welcome back. It is great to have you here. I hope things are going well in the laboratory for you today. Welcome back, Patrick Pirates. Welcome back. And holy cow, Reagan Nation. Five gift subs there. Thank you, thank you, Reagan Nation, for your generosity and your support. It really does mean a great deal to me. Holy cow, thank you for helping keep me on the air with that support. And there's five chatters who are very happy also for your generosity there. Thank you, Reganation. Thank you very, very much. It's excellent. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Here, I'm going to try something real quick. Take the phone to mommy now! Take the phone to mommy! It's the, it's the dinosaur man! Okay. Grim Deviant. Hello there, Danny and Chat. Thank you, thank you for your three months of support. I really appreciate that, Grim Deviant. I really do. And welcome back. It is great to have you here. Holy cow. Uh, and do we have to run this as administrator as well? Oh, goodness. Uh, Windows. Thank you, Grim Deviant. I appreciate you. Holy moly. Um, yeah, and Alex Vixen gives up and hides in a... What are you talking about, Alex Vixen? Sorry, I've not been super in tune with chat. Because things are not working 100% as intended. Let's see. 
93% is a little better there. There we go. We're still working on some of this stuff. And thank you, Reganation. Thank you very much, Reganation. I really appreciate that. Holy moly. Good stuff. Good stuff, Reganation. Holy cow. Yeah. And Golganek says, you have the Darwin Tree of Life, I think, again. I do indeed. Golganek, sharp eyes there. Yeah. I, uh, I have access to a printer now. So I can print out different stuff for every day. I wonder if anybody... You might not be able to see properly in this view. But, uh, yeah, we're gonna have different stuff pretty much every day here. Um, let me scroll up to the top of chat. We'll just do a, a quick who's who of who's in the chat. And if I don't say your name, feel free to just type in some emotes so I can uh, shout you out too and thank you for being here. But we got uh, Matnum33, Smorphosaurus, Neverwinter, Golgonek, Orchestran, Lenina, Tony is my baby, Rosand. Have a moment where it was kind of breaking. I'm no. destroying never. No, what glue is cheap. Hey, cool. I have ontogenized. You have indeed, Steely Dan. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow for those three months of support. Extraordinary, and I really appreciate it, Steely Dan. Thank you, thank you. Uh, um, we've also got Mayor Space, Wheel 62, Phoenix the Archaeologist, uh, Eric is Amber's Lil Stinker, Asazi, Alexander Morrison. Try blaming the dinosaurs. Really quick. Acrocanthosaurus. That one website you use a lot that goes down the different classes and stuff, sort of like a spider. Ooh, onezoom.org. Somebody type in, somebody do the tree command. Claire or, Lena, or Lenina or Mayor Space will be on that. Um, Acrocanthosaurus, thank you for the 100 bits. I appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. That is excellent. And I see we're getting a shout out for California Burbs. Is California Burbs here in the chat too? Let me make my way down and see if we can encounter them. Dinosaur Dave, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. It looks like you are in a green screen. I'm definitely not, Phoenix. I mean, unless it's some kind of green screen with interactivity like this. It's, it's definitely not a green screen, no. Um, yeah, we're still working on our lighting and everything. But uh, who else we got here? Claire Burr. Have I said hello to you yet, Claire? Welcome back, Claire. And Paleo Admira, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Fall Machine, hello, hello. Uh, and there you go, Whale 6 too. I remember the theory of the Brontosaurus by Miss Ann Elk. Uh, um, that's, a, that's a deep gut right there, that reference. Um, who else have we got? Pimpcat, did I say hello to you yet? Welcome, welcome. Dramignified, what's shaking with you? I'm almost down to the bottom. Uh, and Patrick Pirate, hello, hello, Patch. Excellent. Our hype train is now complete. Beautiful. Level two, excellent. And Displacer has requested a dinosaur deep dive force, Bista Hiverser. Before we get into fossil news, let's... Let's do some dinosaur deep dives here. Somebody requested one yesterday that we didn't get to because we took so long on Ankysaurus. So, uh, Matt M33 requested Echilibator yesterday. Matt, you still here? Or are you here right now? If you are, let me know. And we'll do Echilibator. It's a big old Dromaeosaur. And then after that, we'll do Bista Hiverser there for, uh, for Displacer. Welcome back, Displacer, by the way. It's good to have you here. And Matt is here. Excellent. Matt, it's good to see you. Um, why don't we... Um, do a Kilobator real quick. As a dinosaur deep dive. A Kilobator is what we call a Dromaeosaur. So Dromaeosaurs are the two-legged meat-eating, sickle-clawed uh, family of dinosaurs that includes Deinonychus, Utah Raptor, and Velociraptor. There's a lovely Echilibator illustration by Gabriele Guetto, one of the premier paleo artists of our modern age. And holy cow. 
Creative Beast Studio, Beast of the Mesozoic, has also got an Akilabator model. That is spooky looking. <laughs> so this is a Dromaeosaur from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. I think it's a little bit older than Velociraptor, but it is big. It's a big critter. And there's a skeletal diagram showing what we have from it. A big ol' honkin' pelvis there. Reminds me of Utah Raptor's pelvis. Pretty chunky limbs. It's true, Casually Average. Sounds exciting. Yes, indeed, Casually Average. It hasn't been described yet, but it's been announced. We'll talk about that in a little bit when we get to our fossil news. Yeah. And there you go, Lenina. Yeah, feathered dinosaurs aren't scary. Of course they are. Holy cow, you would not want this critter lunging after you in a dark alley. Or, f there it is, standing over a, a dead over Apterosaur, having just dispatched it. This would be a formidable creature. You would not want to, to fall prey to an animal like this. Certainly not. It would eat you while you're still alive. You would watch it eat your guts. Ugh. Ugh. Um, Ankylobator. It's a cool critter, Matt. And that's, uh, I'm glad you've redeemed this deep dive. It's funny, if you had asked <coughs> ask me about this, um, a year ago, I would have told you, oh yeah, Jim Kirkland told me about this, and he said he doesn't think it's real. He thinks it might be a Tyrannosaur. I think maybe Jim was actually a little bit mixed up about something. Um, I think maybe he was getting it mixed up with, um, oh shoot, what's it called? Malevasaurus, maybe. But anyway, the name means Achilles hero. Batar, sometimes transcribed to Bator. Batar is a, a Mongolian word that means hero, like Ulaanbaatar is the capital of Mongolia. That means red hero, as far as I understand it. Um... Anyway, it's a large dromaeosaurid theropod. Uh, Achillobator giganticus is the species name. It's from the Bayan Shiref formation, which I think makes it older than Velociraptor. But we'll take a look here. Uh, considered one of the largest dromaeosaurs, along with Ostroraptor, Dakotaraptor, which I'm not convinced Dakotaraptor is real. I think it's not. Uh, and Utahraptor, which is the largest that we have so far, but. It's interesting. It seems like dromaeosaurs may decrease in size over time, which is the opposite of what we call Cope's Rule. This, like, kind of general tendency for a lineage of organisms for the species to get larger and larger over time. Dromaeosaurs might be an exception here, where they don't do that for whatever reason. Maybe it's because of the rise of tyrannosaurs um, and competition from juvenile tyrannosaurs. Dromaeosaurs tend to get smaller. But anyway, yeah... Um, the stocky and short leg ratio of a kilobator indicates that it was not cursorial, so this is not a pursuit predator. Uh, it was discovered in 1989, the Mongolian Russian Paleontological Expedition to the Gobi Desert, and the Bayan Shira Formation. Bayan Shira Formation is. Let's see. It is late Cretaceous, but I think it's earlier than the Namactor, the Jodocta formation. It's a little bit earlier than, like, Velociraptor and its kin. Uh, seems to correspond best with the Turonian to early Campanian stages. Whereas the Namact formation might even be, like, latest Campanian or Maastrichtian, according to recent dating. Anyway, take a look at that big honkin' pelvis. What's interesting about this is that it's been reconstructed with your typical kind of therapy. This almost reminds me of the pelvis of, like, Allosaurus. Most dromaeosaurs have got a backwards-facing pubis, like birds do. And, uh... Danoninho, Dabel, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Uh, Danoninho. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for following. So that bone that you see at the bottom with the boot at the bottom, that's what we call the pubis. That's one of the three main pelvic bones. Ilium up top, ischium in the back, pubis in the front and the bottom. In dinosaurs like Velociraptor,
You see, the pubis points backwards. This is the case in a lot of what we call advanced dromaeosaurs. So another skeletal from Scott Hartman here. King of the skeletal reconstructors. And Velociraptor, you see that pubis points backwards? It's the same way as in birds. In birds, the pubis also points backwards. This is actually the main source of confusion with, like, lizard-hipped and bird-hipped dinosaurs. Um, yeah. So, in birds, both the... That's A right there in the figure. Both the pubis and the ischium point backwards. In Velociraptor, since Velociraptor is a very bird-like dinosaur, it's starting to do that. But in Achillopator right here, that's not the case yet. The pubis is still pointing not quite as far forward as in more primitive theropods, but it's still not pointing backwards. So yeah, very Saurischian design. Exactly, Alexander Morrison, yeah. Yeah. And Harry Vetch says, Dakota Raptor not real? Like, they faked the fossil? Oh, we'll get to that, Harry. We'll get to that, because there's some more news about related stuff today. You just wait. Yeah. Yeah. And at what point did lizard-hip dinosaurs become bird-hipped? At some point in the... Well, some somewhere along the line to birds. Um, it actually happened multiple times in various groups of Manoraptor and Theropods. But Velociraptor is an example of... Kind of going to that birdie design. Yeah. Anyway. And Tyrannosaurs make everything go funky, says Paleo Adamer. You might well be right about that. When we're talking about uh, the ecosystem dynamics of different uh, different dinosaur faunae. Anyway, Achillobator, big critter. And it might be, you might consider it primitive as far as dromaeosaurs go. Because of the orientation of the pubis and other elements of the skeleton. Yeah, and look at that life reconstruction. Oh boy. You do not want to run afoul of this critter. Holy moly. The feathers to me make it look so much scarier. It's like, here's this big shaggy thing that just... There's something to me really unsettling about an animal with like shaggy integument like that. Like, ugh, ugh. Um, those feathers look like hair to me, lol, says Das Collective. I mean, a lot of early dinosaur feathers would have looked like hair. Yeah. If we're talking about, um, earlier critters like, uh... Like Sinoceropteryx. These guys are feathered, but the feathers looked... Like hair. At least simple filamentous feathers. Maybe kind of similar to, uh... like those of a kiwi, where this almost looks like fur or hair, right? But those are feathers. It's the same with some of these dinosaurs. They would have had even simpler feathers than this, because they are, you know, from earlier in time. But when you're thinking about dinosaur feathers, especially on non manoraptoran dinosaurs, think about like a kiwi bird, you know? Yeah. Um... Anyway, this is a terrifying creature. It reminds me of, uh, this, I saw this on Twitter the other day. Let me see if I can find it. I think I liked it. I should have bookmarked it because I, I was thinking it would come up again. But, uh, in some, some Scandinavian country, they had... Rather than going through my likes, it might be faster just to. Hello. Oh. The creature we will be examining is a paleontologist. Dumb moths. Thank you so much. Holy cow. Welcome, dumb moths and raiders. Back to paleontologizing. How are you doing? Right, let's put this on hold for a second. And, uh. Let me welcome those raiders. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Holy cow. 
I've uh, got a new camera set up today. This is a work in progress, not finalized. But welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. If you're here for the very first time, along with the muffs, let me introduce myself. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. So, devoting several hours of every weekday to answering your fossil questions, kind of shooting the breeze with you about natural history, talking about dinosaurs, about the fossil record, about natural history, about the diversity of life on Earth. That's what this is all about. As a dinosaur paleontologist, dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on, what I dig up during the summers, and I'm here to share that with you to the best of my ability, so welcome to Paleontologizing. And Dumb Moths, how was your stream? I hope it was really, really good. Thank you for bringing your raiders here. What did you get up to today? Tell me about it. Yeah. And new camera, yes, indeed, Dumb Moths. And new office, too. Have you, have you been here since the move? Since the big move? I moved to a new place uh, this past weekend. So, uh, this is my fourth stream from the new place. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, totally missed that. Yeah, dumb off. Well, I guess everything changed. Oh, everything stayed the same except for the surroundings, huh? Still the same old me. And holy cow, Octavius King. Oh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Octavius. And their 43 raiders came here to experience poultry in motion. Voltmog, Move Cubes, CJ Mac, still alive, 93. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Holy cow, it's two raids in a row in quick succession. Welcome, Dumb Moths and Raiders. Welcome, Octavius King and Raiders. Octavius, how did your stream go? I hope it was really, really good. And for anybody who might be new here, Again, let me introduce myself. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here to share that with you. So any dinosaur questions you've got or questions about extinction or evolution or the history of life on Earth, the fossil record, the scientific method, any of that good stuff, don't be shy with those questions here to do science outreach so uh please do not hesitate all are welcome here bring your curiosity and your sense of wonder because that's what we're all about here on paleontology i hope you and the rats and all the other mammals are doing well octi i imagine the mammals would still be small Thanks for bringing everybody here. like this living in the nooks and crannies of their world and we wouldn't be here i would agree with that ultimate fan vermont or is it vt either way Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Holy cow. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Yeah. And Mike is somewhat louder on this view in a good way, says Riddler. Oh, shoot. It's not supposed to be. Oh, boy. Poor Zaku. Thank you for the follow. Of animals that have ever appeared on this planet. The dinosaurs. Thank you. Thank you. Poor Zaku for the follow. Welcome. We're going to run a quick welcome video for any new folks here, like you, Ultimate Fan, or poor Zaku. Oh, and VTuber, yes, lol. I thought VT was Vermont. <laughs> I'm sorry. Very America-brained here. My apologies. Uh, Ultimate Fan, VTuber. Gotcha. Uh, Rain on Concrete says, are Dino Nuggies an accurate representation of dinosaurs? Honestly, no, but what else are you going to do when you're trying to mush, you know, uh, extruded chicken flesh slurry compound into a shape that's reminiscent of a dinosaur, you know? They are literally made out of dinosaurs. Chickens are dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs, as we'll be discussing later today in Thursday Birds Day. But, uh... Anyway, yeah. As Claire says, they are birds. Yeah. Um, anyway, we've got some new folks here. I think this is a lovely opportunity for a little welcome video to introduce some new folks to the channel. So 
Without further ado, I'm going to bring forth friend to one and all, previously recorded Danny. And he's going to tell you a little bit about who I am, why in the world a paleontologist is here on the Twitch platform in the first place, all that other stuff. So, wait, hang on, goodness. He's very eager. We're going to give him center stage right now, and I promise you, you're in good hands. Previously recorded, Danny, why don't you show all these cool new people what this is all about? Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, where's the video game? Well, my name's Danny Anduza, and I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs. But how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell you. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. In my first week there, I started working in the Paleo Lab at Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you're more familiar with that institution and with my old boss than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they say the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler, who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of field work digging at hundreds of sites in the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. In 2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Gasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen, the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy, Trurarcuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, and some others on behavioral functional morphology, basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs. But I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana. So I packed up and moved back to the West Coast. And I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I've moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better, too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended, and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things like Velociraptor's jumps or Archaeopteryx's wings and all the kids who want to see them lining up at a museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's 
who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. And uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously this recorded Lord Danny. Jurassic Park. Digging up dinosaurs is hard, frustrating work. It takes months <laughs> or years, so leave it to the professionals. Pete Walker, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizing. And thank you so much to Dumb Moths and Octavius King for your raids. Thanks for bringing everybody here. Thank you for furthering my mission of science outreach and education. And Rain on Concrete, thank you for the follow also. And Joey Nix. No reason to think dinosaurs wouldn't still be here, wouldn't still be dominating the Earth. And we wouldn't be here, yes indeed. Uh, Rain on Concrete, thank you for the follow. Great to have you here. And you, uh, Joey Nix, appreciate you. Before that, uh, that duo of raids came in, we were talking about this dinosaur doing a, a deep dive on this critter, Achillobator, which is a giant dromaeosaur from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. Think about, like, Velociraptor, but two or three times as big, you know? Huge. It's a lot like Utah Raptor from North America. Uh, a pretty sizable animal. No expense. And thank you, Orchestran, for gifting Rain on Concrete. I do really appreciate that. I do, I do, Orchestran. Thank you, thank you for your generosity. Yeah. Um, it was Matt M33, one of our, uh, our longest-running supporters who requested this dinosaur deep dive, so we're talking about this dinosaur real quick. I don't know a great deal about this dinosaur off the top of my head. In fact, we only have one specimen of it, which is not at all unusual for a dinosaur. Most dinosaurs, we've only got one specimen, usually incomplete. This is how much we have from this animal. But it's enough to tell that it is a dromaeosaur. So it's a member of the same family as Velociraptor, Deinonychus, Utahraptor, etc. Um... And Sir Caffeine, I think, was saying, looks like Deinonychus. Yeah, yeah. And Gary and Kella says, what happened to the missing bones in this picture? Assuming they're missing since they're not drawn in? Yeah. Orchestra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, no. My pleasure as always to support you in your work. I really appreciate you, Orchestra. And thank you for supporting. Science. Science outreach here on this platform, Marcus Drown. I'm putting food on my table. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Uh, anytime that you've got a dinosaur skeleton like this, it's extraordinarily rare for it to be anywhere close to complete. This is actually pretty decent for a dinosaur like this. Um, as uh, as Gary and Kellis was asking, there's a lot that goes into a creature being fossilized. Um, and uh, maybe I can find you. I was going to do the fossilization video, but... Let's take a look at this. Uh, just a quick clip here. 
This is, oh, give me a second and let me get this set up properly. There we go. A close encounter is a rare and thrilling event. Yep. Paleontologist Phil Curry here. Dinosaurs to be preserved in this part of the world is the fact that they were living on a coastal lowland and there was a tremendous amount of sediment coming in from the mountains that were rising to the west at that time. So there were large rivers running across the coastal lowland. And, if and hang on, let's do the fossilization video first. Um, especially for anybody who might be new here. Here's a step-by-step -step guide to becoming a fossil. Hey, can I just get a single shot like a living dinosaur? And Miles C1600, thank you, Miles, for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. Have you ever wanted to become a fossil? Here's how to do it. And Miles says, hey there, I'm more of a meteorology guy. Oh man, meteorology plays into paleontology as well. Paleontology is one of those sciences that takes a bunch of other fields and incorporates them because we're just understanding the history of life on Earth. That includes things like climate and meteorology. So hopefully you'll have something here to be fascinated by too, Miles. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm glad you're here too. Here. If you've ever wondered about how to become a fossil, here's how to do it. Here's a step-by-step yeah. -step guide to becoming a fossil. Step one, die. Once you are yeah, dead, it does take some sacrifice. Maybe scavenged by other organisms. Step two, get buried fast. If you are buried rapidly, your remains won't completely decay or be carried away by scavengers. Your best bet for rapid burial is to die near or in a river, lake, or ocean, where water can deposit sediment over you. And so did you catch that part? There's this bit here where, see, this one antenna gets plucked away. If you are buried rapidly, your remains won't completely decay or be carried away by scavengers. When there are dead creatures that are in the landscape, either underwater or on land, other critters are going to be eating them because, hey, free food. You got to get buried fast if you want your skeleton to be anything close to intact. Your best bet for rapid burial is to die near or in a river, lake, or ocean. Stole on camera. There you go, Mighty Potato. Yeah. Sediment over you. <laughs> Step three, soak in groundwater for a long, long time. Yep. Groundwater contains minerals. Over time, dissolved minerals can harden after filling in cavities in your skeleton. Oh, and did you see that? That's a subtle thing right there. And I've actually never paid attention to this particular detail. But look, there's the antenna and the legs right there. These are like soft tissue bits. They're not nearly as resilient as the rest of the shell of a trilobite like this. Check out what happens to them. Over time, dissolved minerals they fade away after filling in cavities in your skeleton. There are some trilobites that still have the trilobite fossils that still have the antennae and the legs there, but those are pretty rare. Usually it's only the most resilient parts of the skeleton that are actually fossilized. Or the water can dissolve. Thank you, Tarquin. I appreciate that. Welcome back. In its place. Uh, Either way, your skeleton will turn to stone and you'll be a fossil. Oh, yeah. Step four, wait to be exposed. As the years go by, if you're lucky, Sea levels can fall or rock can erode and expose you. Yeah. Then, if your luck holds out, you might get spotted by a fossil hunter yep. and wind up in a museum collection where scientists can study you to learn about evolution. Bingo, that's the dream there, you know? Uh, you might end up in a setting like this. Uh, so we saw that for a trilobite. Let's see it for T-Rex now. Um... There we go. Uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex has And there you go, Neverwinter. I've seen some of those images from Germany. Yeah, yeah. The ultimate expression of savagery and power. For paleontologists like Phil Curry, who scour the boneyards of the North American Badlands in search of the real T Rex, a close encounter is a rare and thrilling event. The thing that allows Tyrannosaurus to be preserved in this part of the world is the fact that... That's cool now. We're living on a coastal... Trilobites are really neat. And there was a tremendous amount of sediment coming in from the mountains that were rising to the west at that time. 
So there were large rivers running across the coastal lowland, and if the Tyrannosaurus uh, body happened to fall in the water, then it had a very good chance of being buried complete. And, yep. Uh, fast burial is one of the most critical factors in terms of uh, preserving an animal. It's like we were talking about. You got to get buried to become a fossil. It doesn't happen otherwise. And there you go, Neverwinter taphonomy. Extraordinarily important. Yeah. So far, 17 skeletons of Tyrannosaurus have been found, all of them from Wyoming north into Alberta and Saskatchewan. Now, and now we actually have Tyrannosaurus fossils from south of Wyoming in Utah, in New Mexico, maybe even in Texas. Yeah. Alexander Morrison says, wonder what possible percentage of exposed fossils simply erode away before being discovered? Slash the practice of paleontology? Most of them, Alexander Morrison. Most of them. Yeah. And Nell says, where would that leave some fossils left inside of caves? They're not fossilized, Nell. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, sub-fossils, like bones that are not permineralized and fossilized, they will eventually crumble to dust if you don't catch them in time. Over thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of years, they'll just deteriorate. You got to get buried and permineralized to become a true fossil. Um, yeah. Yeah. And... Anyway, an ultimate fan, uh, 1996. Yeah. Tyrannosaurus yeah. probably had a much more extensive range than that. It almost certainly lived all the way from uh, the Arctic Ocean down to the Gulf of Mexico. Yep. Only 17 skeletons have been unearthed of the many millions of animals that once lived and died. Probably billions. Um, but in 17, it's like 50 something now. Probably in the low 50s or highest 40s for a uh, number of Tyrannosaurus specimens that we have nowadays. This is from 1996, obviously. So there weren't as many different T Rex known at the time. And uh, Miss Yvette, thank you MS for the gifts up there. Gifted a tier one sub I do really appreciate it. And that is a. You chose well there, Miss Yvette. Thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, yeah. Full of clues. To the mysteries of this ferocious but insert caffeine you know who you should talk to about that finding the ancestors of spiders ants and other ancient insects talk to balint from science streams about that because he literally does that live on stream looking at samples of ancient amber amber is uh like preserved tree resin you know, like in jurassic park remember you know uh preserved tree resin which we call amber Remember that? Uh, he does that live on stream, and it's really cool. The A whole lot of what we know about insects and arachnids and other arthropods, terrestrial arthropods from the age of dinosaurs, so much of that comes from amber, from preserved tree resin. Yeah. Oh, was that the end of that? I guess it is. Is it? The existence of the king of the dinosaurs was unknown until 1902. Yep. Anyway. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit on fossilization. That kind of thing. But let's get back to our dinosaur, Achillobator. This giant dromaeosaur from Mongolia take a look at the original publication in just a minute but we also Utah pulled Raptors, up the most dangerous dinosaur around and phoenix thank you for the 36 months holy cow do i appreciate that phoenix thank you thank you great to have you here yeah and hd and hb how are you doing welcome welcome a kilobator basically it's like a gigantic dromaeosaur a, a gigantic velociraptor or or Deinonychus. It's almost as big as Utah Raptor. And would have been a... Not a critter to mess with. Right before those two raids that we got, I was talking about how this illustration in particular makes it look really... scary to me. Something about that shagginess like that is just... very unsettling. These are feathers, by the way. Not fur or hair. Feathers. 
but they're kind of like... We don't know exactly what the feathers looked like on a critter like this, but when paleo artists reconstruct them like this, all shaggy, it like... It does something to my brain. It's like, this is scary, you know? Holy cow. It's, uh... Oof. And it reminded me of this that I saw on Twitter, that uh, Natalia Yaglieska posted a while ago. Uh, what did you do to fend off e evil spirits this winter? Across Eastern Europe, many cultures during the winter time, as a pagan practice, dress up as monsters and demons to fend off evil spirits. Below are an example of the practice, Kukari. Kukari? I'm gonna butcher that pronunciation. In Bulgaria. And, like, you can see how this is kind of unsettling. Imagine you're walking through the woods at, at dawn or dusk. And you hear some, like, rustling in the underbrush, and you look over, and this thing is shambling toward you like that. Holy cow, that's... There's something deeply unsettling about this to me, you know? Yeah. That same kind of shagginess like that is... It reminds me of this, you know? But this animal is real. Yeah. And then Lenny, I live with two teenagers. There you go, Lenina. <laughs> yeah. And Chewbacca Christmas special? Um, Sir Caffeine, it's called the Star Wars Holiday Special. And I've watched it more times than I would wish on anybody. Oh, boy. Yeah. And let the Wookiee win. <laughs> there you go, Miss Yvette. <laughs> uh, and some original art from Natalia, Anna Van and Jurgen Nathan. Very cool, Tony is my baby. That's very, very cool. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic special, says Patrick Pirate. It's... I remember the first time I saw it, I was, like, bummed out for, like, a week after that. I'm like, ooh, it's like... Something about it just... Oh, boy. I watch it every year. It's awful. That was actually one of my first ever, uh, crossover streams that I did. Watching the Star Wars Holiday Special with Ios. Yeah. Here, um, take a look at this. Everything in Star Wars has a story. Every character, every weapon, every planet, every ship. It has one of the most involved taxonomies of any movie universe ever. There are visual dictionaries, museums, a wiki site, all dedicated to the origins of the characters. There are rules for what belongs in this universe. It has a certain sound, a certain look, a certain feel. And it's easy to feel like this galaxy has always had this distinct, clear identity. But if you go back... I have a bad feeling about this. ...all the way back to one of the very first Star Wars spin-offs, that really wasn't the case. Come on, Mala, let's see a little smile. <laughs> oh, boy. There, that's better. This is the Star Wars Holiday Special oh, man. TV variety show that aired on CBS on November 17th, 1978. It tells the story of Chewbacca's journey home to his family to celebrate a holiday called Life Day. Happy Life Day. Life Day. Try to enjoy your Life Day. The entire <laughs> cast of the first Star Wars film, which debuted in 1977, made an appearance. For how there is a lot going on here. Chewbacca's dead. For how many of you, uh... How many of you have never seen this before and this is completely new to you? Just let me know in the chat because it's it's it is a trip to watch Tarquin. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah, that's new to you, Miss Yvette and Nivy? Oh man. Yeah, it's and that caption oh, sorry. Itchy watches virtual oh, reality softcore porn starring singer Diane Carroll. Oh. Oh. Oh goodness. The Golden Girls actress B. Arthur plays a cantina bartender. The American rock band Jefferson Starship performs in a hologram music video. And the Carol Burnett show's Harvey Corman plays a cross-dressing cooking show host. It's bad. Yeah. Incomprehensibly bad. It's the Star Wars holiday special. I wonder what would... Can we cut tape? Cut tape now. Nah, this is not allowed. You promise. No, you... Uh, nobody is there you go, Anakin Gabriel. Welcome. No, it's not fun. It's so bad. And I mean this kindly if George sees it. It's so bad it's not funny. Do you remember making this Christmas special? I think it was 1978. 
No, you don't remember it? So it doesn't exist in your... No, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. No. What if I were to tell you that I had a little piece of tape right now? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's enough of that. We're supposed to be talking about science here. Gotta finish up this Akilabator deep dive. But, uh, it's so cursed, says uh, Sir Caffeine. It is an accursed thing, you know? Uh... You remember the Jefferson Starship bit? Yeah, that was after they were just Jefferson Airplane and before they were just Starship, right? They were Jefferson Starship for a very brief interim. Not like I remember this from my childhood. I'm not that old. I'm not secretly 90 million years old, I promise. The 70s were something. They really were, Horns found. Yeah, they... I mean, what are you talking about? I don't remember the 1970s. A kilobatar. Let's get back to this animal here. Um, really cool critter. I'm going to give you a link in the chat just so that you can read the Wikipedia article because this is an unusually comprehensive Wikipedia article for a dinosaur this obscure. But uh, let's go back and let's find the original paper here. This is from 1999. Now that I have set up my excuse me external hard drives in my new office here I can look up the original paper so let's go ahead and do that let's open up my PDF library and let's look up a kilobator Mr. Uh, Vet says bless you Bless you too, Miss Yvette. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And Ultimate Fan says, got to set up, start up dinner, then pick up the roomie from work. We'll have this on in the background. I appreciate that, Ultimate Fan. Thank you for the view there. It does help. It really does. Let's see how we're doing, by the way. Um... Ho, ho, ho! Yeah! We are currently number one in science and technology. Very nice. Yeah. Um. Here is the original descriptive paper of a kilobator. I forgot about this. I've read this paper before. There's an illustration of this animal. Who did that illustration? Utah Raptor is the most dangerous dinosaur around. An executive storm. Forty months from executive storm. Holy moly. Do I appreciate that. Executive storm, thank you for your stalwart support. Thanks for keeping me online for the past 40 months. Holy moly. Holy moly. Um, this was a signed pop copy. Um, but it is a scanned pot copy. It's digital here. And, uh, yeah, to my colleague, Professor Phil Curry, in memory of Mongolia, 1999. That must be Peril Altangarel, I think. Yeah. We just saw Phil Curry in the, in the T-Rex video earlier, remember? This is Phil Curry right here. Yeah. You see what a small world this is, you know? Because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Nerf Dermer, holy moly. Nerf Dermer, thank you for continuing that gift sub. I really do appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Nerf Dermer. And that will help us on our Partner Plus endeavor here, trying to get Partner Plus. And uh, and earn some more revenue to continue the stream. Thank you very much, Nerf Dermer. I appreciate you. I really do. Uh, I'll be back for the bird listing. Oh, very nice, Alexander. I'll see you shortly. Yeah. Anyway, this is uh, Phil Curry right here. For paleontologists like Phil Curry, who 
scour the boneyards of the North American Badlands in search of the real T-Rex, a close encounter is a rare and thrilling event. So that's Phil Curry right there. Um, yeah. We're living on a coastal lowland. And this is Phil Curry's copy of this, which has been digitized and uh, distributed to me from a colleague, from Denver Fowler, actually. So shout out to uh, Dr. Denver Fowler, the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in Dickinson, North Dakota. My old crew chief. Learned a lot from Denver. Um, yeah, this is the original descriptive paper of Achillobator, so... Why is this important? This is the introduction of this dinosaur to the scientific world. In paleontology, there is a certain kind of attitude that, like, if something isn't published, then it doesn't really exist. For better or for worse, that's the way that it is. And so this is kind of the birth of Achillobator here, what you're looking at. This is a piece of paleontological history. So in this original paper, it's an interesting font that they chose here. But I think this is from the National Museum of Mongolia. A lot of text here. And we'll have some figures that'll be a little bit more interesting to look at. There we go. Black and white photographs of the maxilla. This is the big tooth-bearing bone right there. We've got some vertebrae. Yeah... Caudal vertebrae right here from the tail. There's not a great deal that we have from this animal, but the hips are there, and they don't lie, as hips usually don't. We've got some claws. Yeah. Good stuff. Achillobator, published 1999, right? Yep. Printed in Mongolia. 1999 from the National University of Mongolia. Achillobator. Pretty interesting critter. There's the fauna there that includes this animal, and Achillobator is one of the larger predators. We also have Electrosaurus, which in my mind is just a juvenile Tarbosaurus type critter. But yeah, yeah. So these are all from the same formation. Achillobator living in the same environment as Garudomimus, Erlikosaurus, Enigmasaurus, which is probably the same thing, honestly, as Erlikosaurus, Talarurus, uh, an Ankylosaur, etc., etc. Anyway, cool critter, Achillobator, and it would be awesome to have some more fossil material from it instead of just one skeleton. But that's often all we have from a particular animal, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. And did Mark Norell sign the, his, that above his name too? Asked Golganak. Is that Mark Norell's signature? No, that could be an N for Norell. But I want to say that's Pearl Altangarel, Al but I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. Anyway stuff. Yeah. Activated Complex says, I'm a little surprised it's not Echilobatar. That's where it comes from, yeah, but they changed the the name, I guess, to Latinize it. Uh, I think that was the idea. Yeah. Uh, I guess a scientific name isn't technically bound to anglicized versions of place names. I... Th you know what? That's a really good point. Since uh, Peril named this he probably was using like his version of the this english spelling of batar there's a bunch of different spellings for that actually um yeah yeah this is Mongolia's only city, Ulaanbaatar. It's drone footage. Mongolia is a large country. It has one city. And part of that might be that traditionally 
most of the people of Mongolia were nomads. Roaming across the countryside, you know, grazing their livestock, moving from place to place. And... Actually, I don't know why that would lead to concentration of a single city, but there's a single city in Mongolia. And it has, like, well over a million people. Holy cow, how big is Ulaanbaatar? Yeah. It's almost comical how many different spellings there are. Um, let's see. Population. Uh, 1,672,000. So it's a, a city of over a million people. There are... So many different spellings of this uh, of this city, and not just other names like Urga, but Ulaanbaatar. I know that's a band, but still, it's another way to spell it. Yeah, it's uh, names and etymology. <laughs> Oh, man, there's so many different names. Uh, English name. Yeah. Um, oh, Ulaanbaatar, there we go. Yeah, a crazy number of names for this city. And a bunch of different ways to pronounce it and to spell it. Holy moly. Yeah. Uh, how many Ulaanbaatars are there to one San Francisco? No. Ulaanbaatar is a bigger city than San Francisco. Not just in terms of area, but also in terms of population. Uh, po San Francisco has about... I think about 900,000 people, something like that. So Ulaanbaatar is not twice as big, but it's like one and a half times as big. Uh, maybe may close to twice as big. It's, it's a big city, bigger than San Francisco. But we've got a whole, you know, the whole San Francisco Bay Area has about nine million people. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, across the bay from San Francisco, over, over there, basically. Yeah. So yeah, does that make sense? San Francisco is pretty. Well, it's not big geographically. San Francisco is on a peninsula, and so geographically, it's not huge. Um, oh, goodness. That'll work. So, this is the San Francisco Bay Area here, North Bay. Peninsula, South Bay, East Bay. This is where I live in the East Bay. This is where I was born and raised and where I live today. There is San Francisco right there. You see, it's restricted to the San Francisco Peninsula. It's not very big geographically. It's hemmed in by water on three sides. Yeah. So, HD says, oh, we don't call it Frisco, though. Oof. But yeah, it is a teeny fingerprint of land. You're right, HD. And Lordy, how are you doing with a new iOS ho 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 emote? That's brilliant. Holy cow, Lordy. Good to have you here. Lordy, also a resident of the San Francisco Bay Area. Maybe her Bay Area senses were tingling. But welcome, Lordy. I hope you're doing well. Yeah. And Slumberless says, is most of the peninsula not considered greater San Francisco? It's not. No. San Francisco is both a city and a county. And so outside the limits, you know, you've got different towns and cities there. There's Pacifica down there where my parents uh, used to live back when they were married. Um, San Mateo, Palo Alto. This is Silicon Valley down here in the South Bay. And I guess into the East Bay too. Fremont is probably also considered in Silicon Valley. Yeah, this region down here would be considered Silicon Valley. This is the East Bay up here. One of the best parts of the Bay Area is it is Pig Latin for beast, you know? East Bay. 
North Bay Wine Country is up here in Napa County. And uh, Muir Woods is up here on, we call this the Northern Peninsula. Uh, so the San Francisco Bridge goes across these from San Francisco to the North Bay. So uh, walking with dinosaurs and uh, all the Endor scenes from Return of the Jedi, Star Wars, were filmed up here in Muir Woods. And yeah, North Bay is huge, Claire Burr. It really is. East Bay, Best Bay. There you go, Lordy. Yeah, yeah. And is Sonoma North Bay? It is, Claire Burr. Sonoma is... Uh, well, actually, Sonoma, I think it's up here. I think it's... It's either south of Santa Rosa or north of Napa, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Do locals call East Bay the beast? Sometimes I do activated complex, but not usually. I don't know. It's the East Bay, you know? Yeah. So there's Berkeley, where the Museum of Paleontology is. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick Pirate says, One day I'll visit Endor. Goals. Yeah. I taste the local cu cuisine, Patrick Pirate. See if those Ewoks are good eating. Um, yeah. And Hayward, I know that fault. Yeah, Jody Fish. Good stuff. I did a live stream with the Hayward fault not too long ago. Got to rep the South Bay real quick. Please do. Afro Bandit Girl. Yeah. Yeah. And Clipper says, I thought Endor was also in Arcade or Redwood Park. You could be right about that. Hmm. Yeah. Somebody was asking about the Presidio. That's where I used to work. Yeah. Oh, and hang on a minute. Um, Activated Complex's Palo Alto is where everybody I know who works in SF lives. Interesting. So that's a long commute for them. Maybe they take Caltrain or maybe they drive up the 101 to San Francisco. Yeah. Um, places like, uh, well, Google headquarters and Apple headquarters... Facebook headquarters, although Facebook is now X, right, or whatever, whatever, or Instagram, what, anyway, that's all down here in the South Bay, um, Twitter headquarters used to be up here in San Francisco until I heard they had some kind of a plumbing problem or something, and they, they are no more, it's a real shame, I miss that website, Twitter, you know, um, yeah. Uh, anywho. Yeah. Now they're MySpace or something? I don't even know. Who cares? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got another, uh, another dinosaur deep dive to do. Back to get to something important, you know? Somebody redeemed Bista Hiverser. That was Displacer, I believe. Displacer, are you still here? I hope you are. So we can do your dinosaur deep dive. Sorry it's taken this long. And then we'll get into some uh, some fossil news after that. So Displacer, give me some sign that you are still here. And, uh... Oh yeah, Displacer. You don't have to call me, sir. But salute to you, Displacer. Let's talk about Bista Hiverser. Oh man, Bista Hiverser... But I hardly know her. Bista Hiverser is a Tyrannosaur from, where else, the Cretaceous of North America, like most Tyrannosaurs. There's a few from Asia, too. But most Tyrannosaurs are from the Cretaceous of North America. I remember when Bista Hiverser was brand new, I was an undergraduate at Montana State University, and, uh... I was reading about it in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. In fact, there's a chance I even have that issue right here. Let me let me take a look. I don't have many physical copies of JVP here in my office anymore. But if I were to save any of them, it might have been this one. It was not. No. That's okay. But, uh, there is... Good 
goodness, that's small. The Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, which is our in-house journal for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, which I am proud to call myself a member. This is a cool critter when it first came out because it's uh, it's got a pretty nice skull. It really does. And the name means the, I think, the runner of, or is it the destroyer of Bista? It's a place name. But man, this critter's got a beautiful skull. Let's, uh, let's talk about it, shall we? Bista Hiversor. Oh, the Bistahi Destroyer, also known as the Bistahi Beast. Uh, it's from New Mexico, from the Hunt Wash member, Hunter Wash member of the Kirtland Formation. While the skull was being prepped, this is what it looked like, and holy cow, is that beautiful. Look at that! Those of you who were here for our crossover stream with Belint last night, remember that gorgeous Gorgosaurus fossil? There's something about these Tyrannosaurs. They just preserve really, really well. Probably because they've got really robust skull elements. When you find them in articulation like this, they are beautimous. Just, ah, breathtaking. Yeah. The first remains now attributed to Bistahiverser, a partial skull and skeleton, were described in 1990 as a specimen of Oblicidon. That's, that's, what? That old dubious taxon. Additional remains consisting of the incomplete skull and skeleton of a juvenile described in 1992. I didn't realize we had so much of this animal. It's uh, it's not a small critter. They get pretty big, as a lot of uh, late Cretaceous Tyrannosaurs do. Um, and yeah, a big head and little arms. Yes, indeed, Claire Burr. And really chunky bones. Tyrannosaurs tend to have that dinosaur, Dave. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. There is a juvenile specimen of this animal mounted, and this is really cool because it gives you a sense for what the animal would have looked like, but you got to kind of look closely to see the actual bones. There's a femur right here and a tibia, a scapula. And then you've got some tail bones going up here, too. This is a neat... Uh, it looks cool. This mount is cool. But I almost feel like it detracts a little bit from the actual specimen. Maybe if you were to see it in person, it would look better. Maybe when you photograph it, it doesn't quite come out as well on camera. But I would have gone a different way about this. I would have made the, the bones themselves... I uh, would have illuminated them with some different lighting. Maybe backlight them, and then uh, and then made the silhouettes of the other of the skeleton there, made that darker. But anyway, it's this is a cool mount. I like that a lot. Just would have done it a little bit differently, but whatever. Hindsight is uh, twenty thirty, right? There's the holotype skull at the Smithsonian. It's a cool critter. There's a reconstruction of it hunting some pentaceratops with which it was coeval back in Cretaceous, New Mexico. This is from what part of the Campanian? 75.5 to 74.5 million years ago during the Campanian. So to provide us some context here. Take a look at this. I'm talking about the Cretaceous period, the upper Cretaceous, the Campanian stage. The Campanian is by far the longest stage within the Cretaceous. Or within the Upper Cretaceous, I mean. So this is from the Upper Campanian, which is interesting, but you really gotta specify. The Campanian is so long. And there's so much that goes on during it that you really gotta, you know, you really gotta specify. Oh, so yeah. It's, uh... That's important to think about. Where were we? 
area. Uh, let's get rid of those tabs. Excellent. Let's go back and look at the original publication of this critter. We'll talk about why it's important. Have they made this open access yet, or do I have to look it up or log in with SVP? No, we are golden. Holy cow. Open access paper. No paywall. Good stuff. I'll give you a link. This is the original descriptive paper of Bista Hiverser, this dinosaur that was published in January of 2010. And this is the first paper that I remember seeing where they actually provide the pronunciation here. Bista Hayverser. Which is funny, because I've... Oh, I guess that's why they provided the pronunciation, because I've always heard it pronounced Bista Hayverser. Bista Hayverser. Oops. <laughs> but yeah, a new Tyrannosauroid from New Mexico and the origin of deep snouts in Tyrannosauroidia. Deep snouts means... No, that's not a reference to Richard Nixon and Watergate. Deep snout... <laughs> means that they've got a snout that's not dorsoventrally compressed. It's taller. Deep snout. Yeah... Uh, generic diagnosis, acute fossilization. There you go, activated complex. <laughs> uh, yeah. Etymology is besta uh, hie, besta hei, place of the adobe formations, Navajo, it's from the Navajo language, in reference to the Bisti wilderness area. Area and Eversor, destroyer in Greek, in reference to the presumed predatory habits of the animal. I think you can go beyond presumed predatory habits. This animal definitely was predatory. It doesn't seem to be an obligate scavenger, nor is it an herbivore. So it doesn't have to be presumed. presumed uh, in every, but look at this beautiful image here. Gorgeous skull of this critter. Really, really well preserved. And it's interesting, that maxillary tooth is broken right there. See the tip of it is gone. We've got these other teeth that are just starting to poke out after the uh, their predecessors, predecessors fell out. Dinosaurs like this would have been replacing their teeth all the time, every year. As longtime viewers of this channel know. Dinosaurs would have never run out of teeth, unlike us mammals, where we've got two sets and we're done. Uh-uh. An insectivore. There goes Smay. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and Otter do it. Welcome, welcome. You can start the stream out. Thank you, Otter. Well, we've been waiting for you. Welcome back. Yeah. Um, And I'll see you in a bit, Bobber. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Good stuff. This is a cool critter. It's neat that we've got enough Tyrannosaurs nowadays that we can start to think about how they actually evolved. It's, uh... It's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Bistahi Verser might even... Or Bistahi... Bistahi Everser. Bistahi Everser. Ugh. May actually be on the direct line to Tyrannosaurus. It's a cool critter. Now that I've shown you the original descriptive paper for this critter, let's take a look at some artistic interpretations. Apparently there's a Jurassic World toy that you could buy? That's kind of wild. Okay. But Creative Beast Studio, like for Achillabator, man, they do love their theropods. Their Cretaceous theropods. They've also done a... Bastahia Verser model. Really well done. Looks a lot like our Gorgosaurus, like we were talking about yesterday. 
pretty beautiful animal, I gotta say. That's a really nice rendering, too. Oh, man, I like that. Yeah. Very cool stuff. Anyway, Vestalia Verser. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. Yeah. That thing is a clear detritivore. Very funny, Alexander Morrison. <laughs> and Not the Brain says, Hello, did I miss the news? Not the Brain? No. You were, in fact, just in time for the news. Um, thank you to Displacer for requesting that dinosaur deep dive. Let me know if you have any other questions about it, Displacer. But it is, uh, it's time to get into some fossil news now, isn't it? Let's do it. Here we go. All right, welcome, welcome back to Fossil News. The part of paleontologizing where we talk about new publications, new discoveries, news in the world of fossil science. We are going to get to this new giant short-necked plesiosaur, a.k.a. pliosaur, from England in a little bit. But first, we've got some slightly more somber news to cover today. We had a question about Dakota Raptor earlier, and I'm like, wait, what? Is this critter not actually legit? Is it not real? We've got to return to this right here. This is something we talked about a few months ago. So let's get back into it. Uh, dinosaur extinction researcher committed research misconduct, but not fraud, university report finds. That might be the university kind of covering their butt there. But, uh, yeah, and Jim Kirkland here says, yeah, sure. Uh, rut row, yes, indeed, Lenina. Yes, indeed. Before we get into that, Let's uh, clue you in on this real quick. Take a look at this. And it would help if the sound were on. What are you doing, YouTube? Now, the theory that dinosaurs were wiped out by a huge asteroid colliding with Earth over 66 million years ago could soon be proved for the first time. Scientists may have found direct evidence of a dinosaur that died in the immediate aftermath. Our science editor, Rebecca Morell, has more. It was the most cataclysmic day in our planet's history. 66 True. Six million years ago, an asteroid seven miles across slammed into the Earth. Actually, no. It probably wasn't the most cataclysmic day, at least not for, for life on Earth, it may have been, a single day. But what would have been a more cataclysmic day? There was a big, big event that happened at one point, and it happened... Pretty quickly. Very quickly, in fact. The Big Bang? I mean, well, that's before the Earth, Phoenix, but good guess, good guess. Yeah. And, uh... Slumberlust? Don't even talk about that. Oh. No. Cubs won the series? <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> And this departure of the continents, Sir Keffy? No, I'm talking about a single event that happened. Here. Um. Take a look at this. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. Holy cow. This new supercomputer simulation 
shows the moon may have formed in just a few hours. Holy cow. When I talk about like a single day that was cataclysmic. It's one of the highest resolution simulations of the moon's formation. Yeah. I didn't realize how molten the Earth still was back then. That's nuts. Yeah, the simulation starts with the collision of a Mars-sized body with our planet, just like Mayor of Space said earlier. Holy cow. Luckily, there were no... There was no life on Earth at the time. Hadn't evolved yet. Had not yet developed. But yeah, that will leave a mark. Yeah, there you go, my man. Yeah. 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 Nuts. This is cool stuff. This is really cool stuff. So that certainly would have been a bigger impact and a more cataclysmic day for Earth, I guess. Except there were no life forms that it affected at the time. Yeah. The great lava lamp. There you go, Patch. Yeah. Yeah. And Kirsten says the fact that it still coalesces back into a sphere is mind-boggling. I mean, that sphere is really natural. That's the natural form that something takes when it's that massive. Like, the gravity will turn it into a sphere. Yeah. Or there's a bit more taffy-like. Exactly, Copernicus Cat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if there had been life back then, we would have left would have left no evidence of it because it would have all be burned up. Exactly, Mirror Space. Yeah. Yeah. Gravity loves spheres. It does, HD. It does. Anyway, back to the beginning of this video. Now, the theory that dinosaurs were wiped out by a huge asteroid colliding with Earth over 66 million years ago could soon be proved for the first time. Scientists may have found direct evidence exactly of a dinosaur. World. It is another world, Musa Musa. So, yeah, I'd call it that. Our science editor, Rebecca Morell, has more. It was the most cataclysmic day in our planet's history. 66 million years ago, be second most cataclysmic, but seven yeah. miles across slammed into the Earth. And the seven miles across, that is, of course, the size of San Francisco. But as you saw in that map of the Bay Area earlier, San Francisco isn't actually that big in the grand scheme of the Bay Area. It's just a little peninsula. But that asteroid was that big, the size of San Francisco, seven miles across. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. And, uh, the age and of the dinosaurs was over. Now, a mass graveyard. If you're on feeling Earth a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. The first Did you get a chance to talk about the young T Rex day. with food found in its stomach? Its last meal was chicken legs. <laughs> Thank you for the 100 bits, Trappy. And yeah, we did talk about that. Yes, indeed. In fact,. Check out the VOD. I talked about that uh, on Tuesday, I think, Trappy. And then we talked about it with Belint yesterday, too. Here. Let's see. We're, no, we're trying to find VODs, not clips. Videos. Let's find that for you. Yeah, there we go. Um, and some paleontologists think that it's Weaver again. It's a different time. Okay, so, so they don't overlap in time. Because there were stomach. Previously recorded, Danny. I don't think it's previously recorded, Danny. Is he? If it is, well, he's doing it. It is now. Job. He's pre predicted all of our questions. <laughs> There you go, Chappy. Yeah. Uh, um. Anywho. Yeah. And moons aren't that amazing. Pluto has five of Pluto has five moons. Copernicus yet? Holy cow! A planetoid can also have five moons. Yeah. The new office looks so spiffy. Thank you, Chappy. Hey. I do appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. I'm adjusting. I feel like it's going well. And I even got a, uh, a new camera today. Well, set up another camera. It's a work in progress. It will improve. Yeah. Excited. Anyway. Uh, and a feline. Yeah, maybe more than one, Jody Fish. 
We'll see if any of them make an appearance. Those are my new landlords, by the way. They're all cats. Yeah. Um. Anywho, and who made the casting? That casting for the dino. Retired 401k. I, uh, I'm not sure. Could you specify what you're talking about here? I'm not sure I understand your question. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back into this. Hey. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Look, look at, that. at that. Look, the oh, scales are preserved. In the crumbling rock, animals, plants, and trees are tangled together, frozen in time like a prehistoric Pompeii. We've got so many details with this site that tell us what happened moment mm. by moment. It's almost like watching. I kind of don't like that this guy has the same the hat as me. We're able to see I contend that I had it first. That first hour or so after impact and that's the front row seat to one of the most amazing events of the cretaceous despite all of the dinosaurs discovered and displayed in museums they don't tell the full story yep. the dinosaurs here were found all less, thank around you. the world and they span their entire 180 million year reign on the planet there you go, Tony. it's widely <laughs> accepted that this domination came to an end when the asteroid struck but there's a mystery no one's ever found well, direct cool, Kennedy. Thank you. of a dinosaur killed by the impact. I appreciate that. Or even a Actually, Kennedy, if you can send me the name of that that friend, I would like to credit them in the file name for that saved file because I'm going to be making a cold open video or something like that with a bunch of fan art and stuff, and I want to make sure that everybody is properly, accre properly credited to the best of my ability. Thank you, Kennedy. I appreciate that. If you could just tell me in, in chat. That'd be great. A fossil dinosaur that died yeah. within 1,000 years of it. Now, though, a discovery Thank you, Claire. Of may have changed that. There's something here. That's hard. More bone. That's bone right next to the skin. This is the moment a dinosaur's leg was discovered, captured by a BBC documentary crew. The fossil belongs to a small plant-eating dinosaur called a Thessalosaur. The team thinks it died in a huge flash flood set off by shockwaves from the asteroid strike. This looks like an animal whose leg has simply been go. ripped off really quickly. There's no evidence on the leg of disease. There are no obvious pathologies. There's no trace of the leg being scavenged. This could be the first bit of dinosaur ever found that died as a direct result of being involved in the cataclysm. Little Thessalosaurus, yeah. After the meteorite hit. Tanis is 2,000 miles away from where the asteroid struck. But what links the two are these tiny beads scattered amongst the fossils. It's thought anyway, yeah. of molten rock thrown up by the impact, which rained back down as glass droplets. Inside and what's... one, maybe something even more remarkable, a fragment of the asteroid itself. We were able to identify the composition of that material. All the evidence, all of the chemical data from that study suggests strongly that we're looking at a piece of the impactor, the asteroid, that ended it for the dinosaurs. So what's really frustrating about this is that this researcher here, Brian De Palma, has been accused of research misconduct. But it's not the conclusions that are being questioned here. It's just his, some of his data. I'll walk you through that. So, dinosaur extinction researcher committed research misconduct, but not fraud, university report finds. Oh, hang on a minute. with my psychom hero yes thank you for all you do professor holy cow balint thank you so much for your continued support at tier three holy cow for 32 months balint i appreciate you more than you know i had a ton of fun doing that crossover stream with you yesterday and uh 
Looking forward to many more of those. Are you are you watching right now or are you also streaming science streams? And are you oh, you're watching right now. Thank you, Valen. We're talking about kind of a difficult subject right now, so any of any input that you might have would also be valuable for this. Talking about research misconduct here. And I'd like to get your opinion on this too, Belint. Holy cow. I I and a bunch of other paleontologists feel that this might not just be research misconduct, but this might be straight up fraud. This might be the university trying to cover their butts about this, you know? Yeah, misconduct but not fraud is such a tricky line. I know, right? Science dreams? Yeah. Oof. Oof. Let's get into it. Uh, paleontologist Robert De Palma, whose claim that the asteroid killed the dinosaur struck in springtime drew accusations of fraud, is guilty of several counts of poor research practice that constitute research misconduct, according to an investigation. The report by the University of Manchester in the UK, which it shared with Science, that's the journal, the journal in which this was published, says De Palma did not fabricate data, but notes that he was unable to say where key isotope data underlying his 2021 paper and scientific reports were produced. And actually, hang on, that was Nature Scientific Reports. It's funny that science is reporting on this. I wonder if Nature is also reporting on this too. They might not want to because that's their journal. Science and Nature? Science and Nature are the two big journals in this field. If you are a, a paleontologist, you... It can make your career to publish in either the journal Nature or the journal Science. They're the two big journals, the big two, and they're like competing with one another. And so it's interesting that Science is reporting on this because the publication was in Nature. So interesting stuff. Patrick Pirate says, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Patch, you're here too. I'd love to get your opinion on this as well as somebody who is, you know, you probably dream of getting a, or maybe you already have publications in nature and science. I don't know. But uh, that can be a ticket to like, that can make your career. Like you can get a job in academia, like a maybe six figure a year job. Let's be honest, probably five figures, maybe four figures. Um, through a publication in Nature or Science, a hiring committee will be very, very impressed with that. Definitely not six, is Patrick Fire fair. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Yeah, may maybe four figures. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah. It is like Lancet or the New England Journal of Medicine. Yeah, those are medical journals. Big name medical journals in paleontology. It's nature and science. Those are the two big, 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 big ones. Top tier journals, what we call high impact journals. Yeah. And four after taxes, RIP. Yeah, I know, right, Patrick Pirate? Uh, yeah. And... Oh, and Patrick Pirate says, I do. You have publications in Nature and Science? I just need Cell to compete, complete the big three. Holy cow, Patrick Pirate. That is impressive. And Science Stream says, I had a first author science paper in undergrad? Holy cow, Belinda. I did not know that. That's crazy. Like science, science, science? Or like one of the open access journals that science runs on the side. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. What would possess someone to say it happened in the springtime? I yeah. He used isotope data and the error bars associated with that are just way too big. Just oh. look up the error bar associated with the KPG boundary. Uh, Eric, that's... Uh, the interesting thing about this is the findings hold up. And I find them convincing. It's not that he's claiming something didn't happen. It's that another researcher who was working under him found some data and she was going to publish it. 
and he basically took her conclusion, it seems, allegedly, in a video game, you know, and we'll talk about it, non-actionable, <laughs> don't sue me, the idea is that he basically took her conclusion, fabricated his own data to publish it before she could. That's the, the accusation here. Yikes, says how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. And we actually know, or some of you might be familiar with the other researcher. We were looking at a video of hers the other day. Oh, hang on. Um, there we go. 66 million years ago, a giant meteorite crashed into our planet and caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. This was the last of the big five mass extinctions. Yeah. This is the only one that we can bring down to a single day. When the meteorite struck into the Yucatan Peninsula and vaporized on impact. It fired infrared radiation across the surface of the planet, killing everything in its path. After the tsunamis and wildfires oh, thank you, Claire, settled down, for posting that, yeah. <laughs> the soot and dust stuck around for much longer, blocking the warm rays of the sun and ushering our whole planet into a nuclear winter that lasted for several decades at yeah, least. So. I'm a vertebrate paleontologist, and I delve into the lives of extinct animals with backbones. You know, like dinosaurs. And to study the extinction of the dinosaurs, I studied fishes. Fishes that died on the day that the meteorite struck that killed the dinosaurs. So this they is where that springtime thing comes from. Their gills, Take a look. They were buried alive by an enormous wave. I excavated these fishes. And, <laughs> and Lenina says she gets so many haters for her hair color that she posted three hot pink hair dyes on Instagram and basically said not gonna stop. Yeah, she did that on Twitter today too. Um, shoot, let me let me show you. Um, and you should follow her on Twitter if, uh, especially if you speak Dutch. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, and she follows me too. Holy cow. Um, we're gonna get her on here one of these days as an interviewee. Um, once I kind of get settled in here. But, uh, where was that? There we go. She says, this picture is for everyone who's ever told me to stop it with the weird hair and just be normal. I call it pink, pink everywhere. Yeah. Um, so yeah, good for her. Yes, indeed, Ice Allen. Agreed. <laughs> it's certainly makes her hard to forget. Holy cow. It's like, oh yeah, who's that paleontologist with the pink hair? You instantly know who somebody's talking about when they say that. So good for her. Holy moly. Yeah. And studied their bones. These bones, they grow similar to tree rings, adding a new layer every year. Good years lead to thick rings, and bad years produce thin rings. And yeah, now that's a, and that's a sound issue growth rings, that the tech people should have addressed. Seasons. And I the Steely Dan. Is that a reference to the song? To yeah. the bone composition. You can think of this as a record of when the animal eats. And osteohistology to study the bone cell distribution. You can think of this as a record of when the animal grows. And I combine these records to reconstruct the seasonality of their growth. There we go. This gave a clear pattern. The fish ate a little bit in spring and started to grow. They ate most in summer and growth peaked. In autumn, growth slowed down. And in winter, there was no food and they didn't grow at all. Here, let me give you a link to her. Uh, All these fishes died at the here. same time, within an hour of the meteorite impact. And their bones all gave the same pattern. 
They had just started to eat and grow again. <laughs> Dye my hair pink. So spring. I've got I've got dark colored hair. I would have to bleach my hair first in order to dye it any color, right? And uh, I'd probably have to dye my beard also. I... Maybe in the future, if uh, if we ever need like a fundraising goal to fund some field work, you know, a paleontological expedition to Antarctica or something, maybe then I'll dye my hair and my beard. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I like this color, honestly. I know it's boring, but it's me. And I like it, you know? You look good right now. Thank you, Ice Allen. I appreciate that. Yeah. And Science Stream says, shame on... Oh, she's a great look. She's got a great look. Shame on people for saying anything. Agreed. One million percent. It's... Uh, I don't know. It's weird to me. It's weird to me that, like, that a lot of men feel entitled to be able to, like, comment on women's appearance and be like, oh, well, you know, you should do this or that. It's like, who are you? What are you talking about? So I agree with you 100%, Belen. Holy cow. She's, uh... She's great. Why do, why do people feel the need to say stuff? I. Whatever. 66 million years ago, the meteorite struck in spring. <laughs> oh, birds are dead this on, yeah. is so exciting. <laughs> you should smile more. Yeah, uh, Charlie's dragon. Ugh. Ugh. The lost moss extinction? Yes, yeah, I It could help explain uh, how the dinosaurs had gone extinct. Let's listen to what she's saying. And so selectively. And spring in the northern hemisphere, of course, means autumn in the southern hemisphere. Yep. Which may explain why the recovery was twice as fast in the southern hemisphere. Interesting. Imagine going to nuclear winter from autumn or from spring, which is devastating. So I think later on in this, she actually talks about... Oh, shoot. I'm just going to let her continue because she put a lot of thought into this, clearly. And uh, I don't want to jump the gun here. Um, yeah. It's autumn in the southern hemisphere. Which may explain why the recovery was twice as oh, fast so in the low. southern oh, hemisphere. No. Gee, you <laughs> Imagine going to nuclear winter from autumn <laughs> or from spring, which is devastating. Yeah. Because this was so exciting, my co-authors and I submitted our research to the prestigious journal Nature. <laughs> it took six Here we go. of rigorous peer review where four external experts were asked to check our work before our paper was finally accepted. We were thrilled. When it comes to scientific publishing, nature is as good as it gets, and our paper was going to get published in a few weeks. So we celebrated as if we were nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> Two days later, we saw that a former collaborator and his team had published the same story. Thank you, Jump Chess, for the hydrate. In a different journal. Oh, and hang on. Sorry, I'm talking over. I'm not trying to do that. Here we go. She was so excited to have finally had this paper, you know, in press. It's about to be published. And then... Later? <laughs> Two days later, we saw that a former collaborator and his team had published the same story in a different journal. Yeah. I felt absolutely destroyed. But, but then I had a closer look, and my disappointment made room for outrage. The other study had no data to support its claims. And it was riddled with mistakes, up to the title. The isotopic graphs were oddly perfect and looked as if every fish ate exactly the same amount every year mm. and, and grew only in summer to then immediately fall back to a winter without food. Exactly the same way every year in every fish. 
and there was no data. There was something fishy about this. <laughs> and because I did the analyses and I knew what the data should look like, I knew it was my responsibility to blow the whistle. I knew I had to stand up and do something. Hmm. My supervisor and I pushed for transparency and requested the data again and again and again. After almost <laughs> a year oh, of getting no response, uh. we went public with our concerns. Yeah, and if they hadn't gone public, this we'd probably never have heard about this, you know? Green Herring says a year? If you're yeah. a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. The yep. other reason why replication studies should be pushed more than they are. I agree 1 million percent, Eric. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Oh, boy. I had to take a stand. And why is it important to stand up for science? Because science denial is rampant. 1% of Americans think the Earth is flat. Vaccines are believed to have microchips in them. And climate change, you know, that's threatening our whole existence on this planet, is dismissed as a hoax. And people actually died because they thought COVID-19 wasn't real. Oh, yeah. Yeah, shoot. So many people Google the Herman Cain Awards uh, for a really sobering look at this. Yeah, was a the first step to increasing the public go, trust in science <laughs> is to ensure that it is true uh -huh. and supported by data. Distrust has real consequences for everyone, and this next mass extinction will affect our species too. From this experience, I learned that being a researcher means more than doing research and publishing papers. Yep. It also takes the backbone to check the work of others and to call out misconduct when you see it. I was made to feel like this was my fault. Even those closest to me suggested it's best to keep quiet. But once I spoke up, I was flooded with support. And I found out that my experience was just the tip of the iceberg. They go yay for Shania, I agree. Now, these sort of things happen everywhere. Someone copies your work in school. Or a colleague presents someone else's idea at a meeting. Sadly, there are always going to be people who think they can get away with lying, stealing, Harassment, or worse. Yep. So what can we do? If you see it happen around you, don't be a bystander. Speak up directly or file a report. If it happens to you, I'm so sorry. It is not your fault. Seek help from colleagues or an old song. I'm sorry there to hear that. There is always support. And remember, they are the only ones who benefit from silence. There you go. As I continue my studies on extinct animals and extinctions, I hope to inspire others to strive for transparency and integrity. And to help out others when it's necessary. Only the truth can help prevent the next mass extinction. Only the truth can help prevent our extinction. Show your backbone. <laughs> a lot. Here is a link to the video right here. That is Melanie Doring. And uh, yeah, that was solid. I agree. Let her do it. I agree. Now, what is she talking about here? 
Well, she's talking about this. Uh, This doesn't seem like full accountability. This doesn't seem like a full reckoning here, but it's something, you know? It's something. Yeah. So paleontologist Robert De Palma, who's claimed that the asteroid killed the dinosaurs, that killed the dinosaurs stuck in springtime, drew accusations of fraud is guilty of several counts of poor research practice that constitute research misconduct, according to an investigation. The report by the University of Manchester, and this is a university doing their own internal investigation of research conducted on their premises, it seems like, or under their auspices, which is shared with science, says De Palma did not fabricate data, did not fabricate data, we'll talk about that, but notes he was unable to say where the key isotope data underlying his 2021 paper and scientific reports were produced. I'm happy the university acknowledged poor research practices and misconduct, says paleontologist and PhD student Melanie During. That's our gal there. That's a big win. She and her advisor, paleontologist Para Alberg of Uppsala University, had failed the fraud complaint. And she continues to think to thank scientific reports. She continues to think scientific reports should retra retract De Palma's paper. Non-scientific information has been published as scientific information, and it is still out there. She says. De Palma, on the other hand, emphasizes the university, of which where he is now a PhD student, cleared him of fabricating data. He says uh, the what he calls errors in record keeping and data presentation collectively were labeled as a form of misconduct and of a negligent sense, which is fueled for self-improvement and positive adjustment. Hmm. A representative for Springer Nature Group, which publishes scientific reports, told Science, rival publication, that they were considering our next steps. The paper bears an editor's note saying the reliability of data presented in this manuscript is currently in question. Let's find that real quick, just to do some independent, uh, independent verification here. So, uh, here it is right here. There we go. Seasonal calibration of the end Cretaceous Cheeks Lube Impact event. And 9th of December 2022. Editor's note. Readers are alerted that the reliability of data presented in this manuscript is currently in question. Appropriate editorial action will be taken once this matter is resolved. I remember this was a year ago. I remember when this happened. A year ago that this happened. Their investigation apparently took an entire year here. After Melanie During... And, and Para Alberg came forward with these accusations. Yeah. The paper's conclusion that the asteroid hit in springtime 66 million years ago is not an issue. And I want to make that very, very clear. Basically, the accusation here is that De Palma and his team, to whatever extent his team was involved with this, that they basically tried to scoop Melanie on this. The finding comes from Tannis. A site in North Dakota led by, at least by De Palma. And the fact that it's on private land is also kind of suspect, honestly. Like, it's kind of a red flag, or at least a yellow flag, you know? Anyway, it supposedly preserves the trove of fossils evidently deposited on the day of the catastrophe 66 million years ago. During who worked alongside De Palma at the site in 2017, published the springtime finding with Alberg and colleagues in Nature, 
in February of 2022, two months after De Palma's paper. In Allegations to Science, last year and in a preprint, Durang and Alberg alleged that De Palma had fabricated data in order to publish the findings first, to scoop them. So here's a link to this from Science. This is from a year ago. There's the link in the chat for you. Yeah. And Tannis, where Indy found the Lost Ark. Yeah, HD. That That's not the name of the site. Like, is this a site in North Dakota? That was not the name of the site originally. De Palma named it that, which is like... I'm not going to... Yeah, whatever. It is what it is. <sighs> he named it that. Um, yeah. We're going to get to Dakota Raptor in a little bit, too, because... Same author. Um, yeah. Yeah. Determine the season of death, both Durings and De Palma's teams reported isotopic signatures taken from fossilized fish bones of paddlefish thought to have been killed minutes to hours after the asteroid's impact. And this is really, really cool because paddlefish are super interesting animals. And if you are not familiar with paddlefish, I'm going to lighten the mood just a little bit. There are paddlefish that are alive today. And they are incredibly weird and cool animals. Take a look at this. Uh, a couple things for our paddlefish. One, the flake. So I'm gonna throw in a little bit of flake for these guys. That's about 20 grams or so. This is from the Florida Aquarium here. These are fishes that existed during the, the late Cretaceous in North America. Their descendants are still around today. Our fish need. So, and this is part of the Hell Creek. Yes, Tony is my baby. Yeah. Yeah. Two to three different sizes of pellets. Same you can see the paddlefish swimming in the background. Yeah. So making a nice little, almost like a little protein smoothie. <laughs> so some flake and three different sizes of plants. So they're filter feeders, as you'll see. Some frozen food. So these are just different kinds of shrimp. And these are actually worms, and these are things called copepods. So these are all the different kinds of vertebrates that were thrown in that our paddlefish will eat um, naturally in their environment. Paddlefish are really, really neat. Right. So this is a key part of the paper. That's why I'm showing you this in the first place. I'm a beta toy. This feeding apparatus just because the paddlefish eat out of the water column. Uh, they are basically filter feeders, so they're swimming yep. through the water. Filter feeders. The water is going through into their mouths. So this feeding apparatus was our best idea to make sure that all of their food does just stay in the water versus floating on the surface or just sinking right to the bottom. So. Nice invertebrate smoothie for them there. So those are the paddlefish. They are so cool. How they got their name. Yeah, right, Green Herring? They've got this big rostrum on the front that I think is the source of their paddlefish name. Yeah. Very cool. Here. Um... Huge paddlefish feeding here. They are... It's crazy, like, how much their bodies expand when they open their mouth. They're just... You see, they're kind of cruising along, using that rostrum there. They look pretty sleek, and then they just open their mouth, and they go... Rung, rung, like that. Kind of like a basking shark. Or like a baleen whale. Yeah. Even... 
You've seen these before? Yeah, Red Bulwark. They're really neat. Yeah. And Alexander Morrison. Uh, the last of the Chinese paddlefish. Chinese paddlefish are now extinct. And that was the Three Gorges Dam that I think caused their extinction. Um, that was the final blow to them. Which... Yeah. American paddlefish almost went extinct at one point, too, if I remember correctly. But yeah. What's the nose for, then? It says Slumberlusts. That's basically... Uh, I think they use it for senso perception. So as they're moving through the water column... They've got sensory organs along that, and they can detect prey in the water. They can basically detect... I think it's something to do with, like, detecting, uh... Like, where there's good stuff to eat. But also, it's a hydrodynamic purpose. So, it is long and flat like this. And that, I think, basically helps funnel water through their gill rakers like that so that, uh, so that they can eat their food. Yeah. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. You better believe that's a paddling. There you go, Raven. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Simpsons reference. Yeah. Um. Good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway, that's paddlefish. Paddlefish. Pretty neat. Now. There we go. Uh, to determine the season of death, both Durings and De Palma's teams reported isotopic signatures taken from fossilized fin bones of paddlefish, thought to have been killed minutes to hours after the asteroid's impact. In modern paddlefish bones, seasonal dietary changes lead to higher, level, higher levels of carbon-13 during spring. During and Alberg found similar, similarly high levels in the ancient fish. De Palma's graphs of isotope levels also show the springtime spike, but the paper does not include the raw isotopic data. In the preprint and complaint, During and Alberg say that irregularities in the graphs suggest data fabrication. Data fabrication. Ew. Oh, brother, this guy stinks. It's If this is true, this is a huge deal, you know? This is not just misconduct, but possible fraud, you know? Yeah, very gross. XF Kirsten. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. Not at all. Sad trumpet doesn't do it justice. This is not... Ugh. I feel bad for, like, putting that. It almost... That almost makes light of the situation, which is not what I'm trying to do here. Believe me. The university's Research Governance, Ethics, and Integrity Office investigated... Uh, and both During and Al Alberg appealed the results, which have not been released. They have not been released. The appeal panel's report, released to science, includes De Palma drew the points in the graphs by hand from an interim data sheet given to him by his now-deceased co-author, Curtis McKinney. This is going to be important in a couple minutes when we talk about Dakota Raptor as well. This might be like a comment... Well... This might be a repeated process that this author has done. Yeah. The irregularities were explained as genuine errors resulting from the lack of raw data as a consequence of the death of McKinney, the report says. Hmm. McKinney worked at Miami-Dade College, which lacks the type of mass spectrometer needed for isotope analysis. Although McKinney's institution did not have the kind of apparatus supposedly used for the analysis, this was not evidence that McKinney had not sent the samples elsewhere for analysis, the report says. It adds that the investigators found evidence that the Ostatop data existed in 2017 before During visited Tanis, so there appeared to be no motive for fabricating the data. Then where are the data, you know? The report faults De Palma for poor research practice and for not being transparent about the fact that he did not know in what laboratory the isotope analysis had been conducted, how and by whom. Together, these failings constitute research misconduct, the university writes. The panel absolved two Manchester researchers who co-authored the 2021 scientific reports paper, Phil Manning and Roy Wigelius, because they were not supervising De Palma while he worked on the paper and did not supervise the isotope work. 
De Palma's research leading up to the paper is performed in part while he was a PhD student at the University of Kansas. This is also has to do with Dakota Raptor as well. Other isotope experts say they'd like to know where the data came from. In my expertise, it is highly irregular to not include any primary data tables and instead rely solely on hand-traced figures, particularly with no disclosure of that choice. Writes Thomas Cullen. I know him. I used to run into him all the time. Along with uh, with Dave Evans up in northern Montana back in like 2016, 2017. 2015, 2016. And 2017. He's an ice step researcher at Auburn University in an email. Uh, John Eiler, an ice step analyst at the University of uh, California University of Technology, says the data are not only inconsistently reported, but also implausible. The report notes that an outside geochemist told the appeals panel that the presented isotope data were too good to be true. Eiler adds the inconsistencies re McKinney's involvement were never addressed. I would not accept this issue as settled without seeing the, these two issues resolved. The report concludes by saying the university will give De Palma the opportunity to redo the experiments. Here's a link to this, if you'd like to read more about it. There you go, right there. Far be it from me as, you know, a nobody here on Twitch to critique an author who is, you know, had these big discoveries. <laughs> Linux Twitch, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome, welcome. I want to make it clear that this is not just me. There are other paleontologists who are, uh, well, yeah, Jim Kirkland, longtime viewers are very familiar with. Papa Jim there says, yeah, sure. Misconduct, but not fraud. Yeah, sure, says Jim Kirkland, saying this publicly. But, uh, here we go. I'm trying to find the rest of the, where did I see the rest of this? Um, give me a second here. Because it's, it's interesting to see. Yeah, there we go. Richard Butler, another paleontologist, says if someone is unable to evidence where their data came from, then surely the paper in question should be retracted. Scott Hartman says, it seems that this should have been the automatic default response even before the ethics investigation. LJ. Many of you are also familiar with LJ Krumenacker, who's appeared in an interview on this stream before. Done some work with LJ. He says, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Melissa I. Party says, This whole thing just reinforces a gut feeling I have that we're not all playing by the same set of rules in academia. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. There were other researchers who also had takes on this too, and I'm going to see if I can find those real quick. Too, but I'm trying to remember where it was that I saw there was a big thread with a bunch of different paleontologists talking about this. Uh, yeah. 
trying to remember who was... Um... Did Dave, Dave Evans have something to say about this too? Um, I really respect his opinion, and if he had something to say... Yeah, there we go. There's Thomas Cullen right there. We used to run into each other all the time back in, you know, like 2015, 2016. Out on the field. It says, given the finding of research misconduct against De Palma, the lack of transparency and the restricted access to the site, and the odd story about the source data, will people be convinced by the same team redoing the study? With all of his other research, uh, will all of his other research need to be read with this in mind? Much larger mysteries still remain. And Emily Ev, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Yeah. And Tom Holt says, as of the first, given that the During team actually found the same conclusions first, I think the salient points will stand based on During's findings. So basically, did the extinction event happen in the spring? Yes, the evidence still points to that. But the second point... Should we reconsider everything else this guy has ever published? It's only fair, you know? It is a shame that it taints the work of the co-authors. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, interesting stuff. Belint and Patrick Pirate and any other active researchers who are here on Twitch could probably tell you the same thing, that sometimes there is misconduct in academia. It happens. There are egotists. There are people who think that the rules don't apply to them. There are, is... There can be some real scumminess in the world of academia. And that hurts all of us. It's imperative that we stand up to those people and that we don't back down. So we'll see what becomes of this. We'll see if this is one of those cases, but honestly, it's really looking like that's the case. Don't want to draw any premature conclusions here, but I don't know how premature this is. It really seems like there was something really shady going on here. And that continues to... Other stuff like Dakota Raptor as well. Not just this. This is from National Geographic. Oops. Giant raptor's wishbone is actually a bit of turtle shell. Dakota raptor itself seems to be chimeric. Last November, paleo this is from 2016. Paleontologists announced the discovery of Dakota raptor, a supersized relative of Velociraptor, that stalked the Hell Creek Formation of North America alongside Tyrannosaurus rex. The dramatic beast was described by Robert De Palma. From the Palm Beach Museum of Natural History in Palm Beach, Florida. Yeah, but now Victoria Arbor from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences has shown that one of Dakota Raptor's bones, the wishbone, or furcula, isn't what it seemed. It wasn't even part of a dinosaur at all. It's actually a piece of turtle shell. Yeah. Ugh. It's not great. It's not great. And Valiant Cheese, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? How did your stream go? Unfortunately, we're talking about something um, not super fun and lighthearted right now. We're talking about academic misconduct. We're talking about 
honestly, potential fraud in paleontology. And, uh... Yeah. Linux Twitch, that doesn't sound like... Says that doesn't sound like a mistake. I think this legitimately was... Kind of a mistake? Yeah. Although... Anyway, there's a lot about this paper that honestly is a little suspect. The original Dakota Raptor paper. The fossils at the time were privately owned. They were not reposited in an accredited institution. It's published in an extremely small journal, and the editors aren't listed, so... It's very unclear who the editors were, and whether this thing actually was peer-reviewed in the first place. And several of the author, well, at least one of the authors was deceased at the time of publication, too. And the phylogenetic data, apparently, hearing this is a rumor, were said to have been provided by the deceased author. And then nobody could actually find the raw data in that case, too. Was that journal News of the World? It was not Will 6-2. It was far more obscure than that. go. Dakota Raptor is a potentially chimeric, it is almost a million percent chimeric, yes. Anyway. Um. Yeah. The parts highlighted in white are the parts that they actually have. Notice that the furcula isn't there anymore. Oh boy. But yeah... Uh, this was found in what we call a sandstone leg, so this is like... And Memu Wewu, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. This is found in basically like a hodgepodge of a bunch of different bones that all were brought together by a river. This is a fluvial environment. There's no real indication that Frankly, any of these bones really belong to the same animal, if we're being honest. Yeah. It's... Yeah. It's frustrating. There's the original paper there. From Paleontological Contributions to the University of Kansas, if I remember correctly. Is that the name of the journal? Um, or the KU... Kansas University Paleontological Institute Paleontological Contributions. Here's the original paper. Yeah. It's not immediately clear... Who actually edited this? One of the authors was deceased by the time it was published. Apparently, while they were looking, like, I don't know how many different journals this got shopped around to, and it was rejected from all of them until it was published in this journal. So, yeah. Yeah. You didn't know that Dakota Raptor was also De Palma, Neverwinter. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's... Yeah. Here's a post by Scott Hartman here. About this... The whole misconduct thing. More recently, he says, I'm sorry, but as long as there is no raw data, no one is willing to come forward and say, we ran this at our lab, then it's hard to accept it isn't fraud. And at the very least, the paper should be retracted since it's not reproducible. And Tom Holtz has agreed. I think it's in part butt covering by Manchester and in part the failure to directly demonstrate fraud. He says, I'm sure you're right, although there are unequivocally, unequivocally made up or manipulated diagrams in the paper, and I'm unsure how that isn't direct fraud. If they didn't have the original data, they shouldn't have published it until 
they either retrieved it or ran it again somewhere else. 1,000 bits can make a wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation and understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. Holy cow, go for bronze. Love to see the stream doing well. Great job. I really appreciate that. Go for bronze. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow, go for bronze. Thank you for the 1,000 bits. Bonus bits unlocked. We added 50 more bits. And holy cow, Twitch, thank you for the 150 bits also. This is this bonus bits thing that I was hearing about. Fantastic. Holy cow. This is, what, until January 2nd, I think? Anybody who uh, contributes bits to the channel, Twitch will match those to a certain percentage. Which is extraordinary. Thank you, thank you, Go for Bronze. A real mean kid. With you wary, thank you. Teeth, he was the, the follow. Welcome to Paleontologize. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Anyway, this is an interesting thread here, and... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It kind of calls into question the Dakota Raptor thing as well, as this person points out. They say, you know, this reminds me of the Dakota Raptor paper where he attributed the phylogeny to the late Larry Martin, who had already passed at that point. Try blaming the dinosaurs. And thank you, Jerry at Rick, for the 100 bits there. I appreciate that. I, I don't know what the lower threshold is for Twitch to match or match a percentage of bits, but thank you, Jerry at Rick, for those 100 bits. Thank you, thank you. We got a hype train going here. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Prudence Goodwife died in 1641, and she wrote on this paper, so did Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper. There you go, Cobraven. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. Yeah. This person says, looking back then makes me even more suspicious of De Palma doing that. Yeah. And the Dakota Raptor phylogenetic data set was never published, and he cited that as to why. And Scott Hartman says, yep. And repeated entreaties, entreaties for the data set while we were working on the Hesper Ornithoides paper were ignored. Sort of feels like reproducity. Re, sort of feels like reproducibility isn't high on his list. That's. Uh. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. By the way, Scott Hartman is the guy we mentioned earlier in our broadcast when we were talking about dinosaur skeletal diagrams. Um, here. Skeletaldrawing.com is his website. And uh, he does really good stuff. Really good stuff. Um, yeah. Check him out. There's a link to his blog there. Um, the king of skeletal drawings, Scott Hartman. Anywho, yeah. Oh, and it's 300 bits minimum. Thank you, Will and Lenina and Orchestran. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. So there's that current drama there. Drama almost uh, makes it sound frivolous or something. This is, this is wild stuff, and it... We'll see what becomes of this. Anytime there's misconduct in science, it hurts all scientists. This is not good. This is really, really not good. As Melanie Doring said in her video, uh, in her TED Talk, I would heartily agree. So we'll continue to, uh, to follow this story as it unfolds. This has been doing now for over a year. Anyway, we've got some other fossil news to discuss. Let's run the fossil news stinger one more time. And we'll continue our fossil news. Here we go. All right, continuing with fossil news.
our other top story tonight. Skull of an ancient sea monster with dagger-like teeth discovered in England. That's a sensational headline. What we're talking about here is a marine reptile. The six-foot-long fossil could offer new clues about the pliosaur, known as the largest carnivorous reptile to have ever lived. And there he is right there. No, of course, that is... Absolute treasure. David Attenborough right there. Um, can we get some paleo salutes in the chat for David Attenborough? Um, living legend. Holy cow. David Attenborough for scale. Take a look at that big honking skull. That is insane. Look at this. This is a creature that we call a pliosaur, which is a kind of short-necked plesiosaur. These were four flippered, short tailed, short necked, big headed critters that ate ichthyosaurs, they ate other plesiosaurs, they ate all kinds of stuff. Pliosaurs. Not a dinosaur, but a kind of ancient marine reptile. While dinosaurs were doing their thing on land, these guys ruled the seas. And Kronosaurus is an example of a pliosaur. Yes, indeed, Smorphosaurus. Huge, says Will62. I wish we had that that soundbite, like from uh, Ios's channel. Huge! They were enormous. That's a really neat illustration there. I think that's supposed to be Liopleurodon. Some of you might remember this from Walking with Dinosaurs. Um, take a look. Oh. That's a pliosaur for you there. They'll do that. <laughs> um, I'm sure there were some cases over the course of tens of millions of years that pliosaurs ate theropod dinosaurs. I love that because it's so dramatic. That's the kind of critter that we're talking about here, you know? Yeah. I'm not going to lie, they had us in the first half and go activate a complex, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the spring of 2022, Philip Jacob, as an artist and fossil hunter, was walking across the Jurassic Coast in southern England when he came across a snout. It was about two feet long. That's, that's a long snout. I... Oh, goodness. And now our camera's frozen. Sorry. Anyway, sorry. I very much doubt that anybody watching right now has a snout that's even one foot long, let alone two feet long. You know? It was about two feet long, complete with teeth, and appeared to have come from an ancient ocean predator known as a pliosaur. By the way, pliosaurs are a group of Plesiosaurs. I th I'm not 100% sure it's a monophyletic group. But they are not dinosaurs, as you'll see here. Dinosaurs on our family tree begin right here. Everything that comes off of this node is a dinosaur. Everything that evolves from that ancestor. Pliosaurs are here. They are here next to the long-necked plesiosaurs. Long-necked plesiosaurs. Nothosaurs. Turtles are over here. We're not 100% sure where this group actually belongs, but we know for sure they're not dinosaurs. That much is clear. And they're not related to crocodiles, as somebody was asking earlier in the chat. Crocodiles are over here. They are archosaurs. Pliosaurs and the other plesiosaurs are, uh, they're from a different group of reptiles. So they're not dinosaurs, they're not archosaurs, they're not crocodiles. Yeah. They are non- Dinosaurian reptiles. There you go, Charlie's Dragon. Yeah. 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 And Diagnosis, I've seen the photos. Looks like the tip of the snout had fallen from the cliff. 
That's typically how it goes there, along the uh, the Jurassic Cliffs, along the Jurassic Coast. When crews returned days later with a drone, they found the snout had fallen from a cliff. There you go, diagonal, yep. Towering over the beach, embedded in the cliff was the rest of the skull. The more than six foot long fossil, the skull intact and no bones missing, is the discovery of a lifetime, one expert said. There are some special features in it we haven't seen in the previous ones that have been discovered. Steve Etches, uh, a paleontologist who has been collecting fossils for more than 40 years and was involved in the investigation, said by phone on Monday, and it's the most complete. So the whole skull is there. There are no bones missing. Beautiful. Yeah. Pliosaurs were the largest carnivorous reptiles that ever lived, Mr. Etches said, and reigned at the top of the food chain in the seas of the Jurassic period. They were probably solitary hunters who preyed on plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs. Other marine reptiles, he added. They are rather like lions on the Serengeti, Mr. Etches said of the pliosaurs. You get a pride of lions, but thousands of antelope and everything else. It's the same as the Jurassic seas. So I guess he's saying that these big, gigantic predators were far outnumbered by their prey, which makes perfect sense. The skull is being kept in the Etches Collection Museum of Jurassic Marine Life in Kimmeridge. Around seven miles west of the Jurassic Coast and more than a hundred miles southwest of London. Mr. Etches says the museum was working to get the skull into a display case for viewing in January. And there is a reconstruction of this critter about to end the life of a poor ichthyosaur. Oh boy. Yeah. Pliosaurs lived between 200 million and 65.5 million years ago. I don't know if they actually existed until this time. I think they went extinct before that, didn't they? Same time as the ichthyosaurs? I don't think they exist until the end of the Cretaceous. I think that's wrong. Yeah, they can grow more than 40 feet long. Um, there was nothing in the ocean that could have escaped an attack, says Dave Martill. Yeah. Anyway, let's take a look at the video, shall we? Because we have video here. Let's have ourselves a look. Fell out the cliff. Rip. I didn't find the tip of the snout. That fell out the cliff. I just found something quite extraordinary. Oh, my. It's Holy the cow. End of the jaw of the teeth of a massive pliosaur. That's nuts. He went back. I so love that they have video of that. I guess welcome to the 21st century. Welcome to everybody having a 10 megapixel camera in their pocket. That's really cool. That's really cool. And Tarquin, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe the writer was thinking of plesiosaurs. Yeah. End of the jaw of the teeth of a massive pliosaur. That's amazing. Look at that. And here, let's go back. It's hand for scale. End of the jaw of the teeth. That's just the end of the jaw. With the guy's hand for scale. Enormous. Enormous. Welcome to the Jurassic Coast. Yeah, there you go. Welcome to Jurassic Coast, says HD and HB. Uh, and uh, Wikipedia says the chrono range of Pliosauridae is late Cretaceous to 89.3 million years ago. Yeah, diagonal. They probably died out at the Cenomanian mass extinction or a Cenomanian extinction event. Here. Linear time. Around the same time as the ichthyosaurs. At the end of the Cenomanian, yeah, 93.9 million years ago. Something like that. That would make sense. That'd make a lot of sense. The teeth of a massive pliosaur. Yeah. Went back again with a drone to see where it would come from. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, this is great. Look at that. Behind us is the most complete. Holy cow. Look at those teeth. That's nuts. That's nuts. Sand, sand, pliosaur, sand. Wait a minute. Yeah, handy. And Tony says he can tell it's a pliosaur just from walking up on it like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's really diagnostic when you see the, the front of the snout there. Like, I could tell you that's a pliosaur just by looking at it. It's too big to be an ichthyosaur, and those are pliosaur teeth. Holy moly. 
Yeah. Look at that. What's behind us is the most complete pliosaur skull discovered probably worldwide. The fact that it's got its teeth mainly still in the sockets, meshed together in the jaw, it's almost, you know, unheard of. <laughs> the whole logistics of finding something halfway down a cliff, learning to prussic, which is basically abseiling the wrong way, but with a lot of physical effort, rig up a compressor on the top of the cliff with airlines and start to dig a cave into the cliff to expose yeah. the rear of the fossil reptile's head. We never done that amount of work. before. And you're learning all the time. Luckily, on the last day of the project that we had before the climbing firm had to go back, we got it at half past nine, finished it that night. Yeah. When we first got this it in really here... This is what paleontology is like. Layer T, I mean, yeah. Layer T, did you unfollow by mistake? Welcome back. <laughs> and uh, Teza Pandawan, yes, this is recent. This video just came out a few days ago. Uh, four days ago. And uh, it was in 2022, I think, like, last winter, last spring, that this find was made. Yeah. Yeah. B Base Power says, nice you're covering it. I was reading about it on the news a couple of days ago. Yeah. I Sometimes with big stuff like this that that is all over the news, I try and give it a few days to talk about it. You know, it gives other people a chance to hear about it and ask me about it first. And I say, you know, wait, 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 we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Yeah. It was still in the crate that it had gone up the cliff in. Here we go. All the time. Luckily, on the last day of the project that we had before the climbing firm had to go back, we got it at half past nine, finished it that night. Yeah. When we first got it in here, and it was still in the crate that it had gone up the cliff in, and there was fragments of bone and foam, and there was a mouse's nest in there, and a mummified <laughs> mouse, and, and it was just like... <laughs> daunting amount of work you get to this <laughs> this is the pinnacle really of of the things that i've been involved with up to now all i want from it is more information the science is the thing that drives me yeah, is what does it show? recent what does it tell you anything different there's going to be a lot of people fighting over this and discussing it yeah it's a new species very likely a new species because it has a few um novel features especially in in the way that it's its sutures are and it's Cool that they got her in front of another. Is it a pliosaur or a crocodile? It's got to be a pliosaur with the fluting on the teeth like that. Organized, yeah. uh, especially around the, the nasal area and the snout. These teeth, they got two carinas, so sharp cutting edges. Ridges along the two faces of the sort of tooth there, supposedly to break the sort of vacuum. More and look at, look at the pits on the snout too. Did you see that? See these like pockmarks here, these pits on the snout. These would be for blood vessels to go through, probably like a sensory apparatus on the snout. Yeah, and uh, yeah, pliosaur, not a mosasaur, Claire. The mosasaurs probably evolved to replace the pliosaurs, which went extinct. Uh, the evolution of mosasaurs is probably tied directly to the extinction of these guys. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and More nerves, Jerry, Rick, yeah. Yeah, so... This is like a sensory apparatus that you're seeing here on the snout. Um, These teeth, they got two carinas. Yeah, so those. And we've known about this for quite a while, actually. Here. Back to this. Yowza! So that's a pliosaur there again. I thought they would talk about the sensory apparatus there, but they didn't. I would misremembered that. They're just talking about sense of smell here. But, uh, yeah. Those are sensory pits probably like we'd see on a crocodile or on a spinosaur. Um, for being able to feel with that snout, too. Yeah. And Thalatosuchians may have been competing with these pliosaurs, the smaller ones. Yeah, I agree. Marine crocodile is Alexander Morrison. Alexander Morrison, yep. Yeah. It looks like they gave it gills in the animation. Yeah, those aren't supposed to be gills diagonal. It's an air-breathing animal. So sharp. But yeah, yeah, you know that. Along the two faces <laughs> of the sort of 
tooth there, supposedly to break the sort of vacuum. More advanced features such as these uh, pits and that at the front of the snout. But it also has a very unique sagittal crest, which is this yeah. light sensitive third eye, which stretches all the way from the very back of the skull to about a third of the way along. Third eye, that like a pineal eye? Particularly well developed. So it's got an extremely large slit for, for the eye and the crest is particularly high. Like on a tuatara? The height of the crest might huh. be an indication of differences between the sexes yeah. of these pliosaurs. Walking with dinosaurs However, did don't really have enough specimens embiggen their liopleuridum sure. too much. And the other thing that I'm wondering about is its stage of development. It may be that that pliosaur is still developing and is still in a juvenile stage or a Holy late, cow. Juvenile, late teenager, you might say. It's a proposal, it's a hypothesis at the moment, I can't be sure. We have fragmentary data from the Kimmer region. Vertebr and Mary's space, has the skull been flattened a bit? It, it has been. You can see how it's deformed there. Sure. And the other heaven um, of different eyes way along, that seems to be... So yeah, it's been squashed a little bit. So this happens a lot with, uh, with any kind of large skull in the fossil record. It'll get smushed, uh, deformed during diagenesis, during fossilization like that. Holy Lifton! Holy cow! Thank you for those five gift subs there. I appreciate that very, very much. I really do. Thank you, thank you, Holy Lifton, for Holy your generosity. Change things with those five gift subs. And your support of science. science outreach here on Twitch. Thank you, Holy Lifton. Um, those five chatters, uh, including Iwix Arts, beautiful, are, uh, I'm sure, very grateful for that. Well, thank you, thank you, Holy Lifton. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Be particularly well developed. So it's got an extremely large slit for for the eye, and the crest is. Open your third eye, high. man. Yeah, except the Justin. The height of the crest <laughs> might be an indication of differences between the male and female sexes of these pliosaurs. However, we don't really have enough specimens to be able to say that for sure. And the other thing that I'm wondering about is its stage of development. It may be that that pliosaur is still developing and is still in a juvenile stage or late juvenile, late teenager, you might say. It's a proposed... So the idea is that, like, this thing might not be mature. They might get so much bigger than that. It's a hypothesis at the moment. I can't be sure. We have fragmentary data from the Kimmeridgian. Vertebrae also paddled... Kimmeridgian is a, is a time period. So going back to this, to our uh, our geologic time scale, we go into the Jurassic period, and uh, in the Upper Jurassic, you've got the Kimmeridgian stage from 157 to 152 million years ago. So it's from here, um, in the late Jurassic. That suggests that there were larger pliosaurs around. We just haven't found their skulls yet. <laughs> and if that is the case, then already at 1.7 meters, this animal is large and would suggest that had it lived, it would have become larger. This is the top of the food chain. These are described as the, the largest carnivorous reptile. There you go, little pig pony. Certainly they were <laughs> the mega predator of the, of the Jurassic Seas. Once upon a time, these creatures were broke away from the line of plesiosaurs, the long-necked, small-headed marine reptiles, and went on their own way, their own path, yep, and evolved diverged. into these monsters which existed in the Upper Jurassic. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lineage of where they've come from, which is, you know, now much more documented than ever before. And with scanning technology now, more nice. and more information can be gathered. Holy cow. If you think about it worldwide, how many pliosaur skulls we've got, there's probably, you know, anything really, really good. It's not that much. So it's still a learning curve on these things. So the more fossils we find, the more evidence we can build on that. Oh, You've absolutely. You've got to find the evidence. You've got to find the facts before you We need more fossils. Statements. Yeah. Something like this, it inspires children, hopefully gets yeah. them out looking for fossils, captures their adults. imagination. You know, because they're the future of science and the future of paleontology. And long may people be allowed to collect this stuff because if it's not collected, it's eroded, it's gone. When you look yeah. back, it was incredible. It was incredible. And, you know, what a thing to be involved in. This is something that 
I'll probably never get involved with again ever in my life. So yeah, it's quite humbling in a way when you look back what you see and what you find. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And we will be hearing a lot more about this, I'm sure. There's probably going to be a big old BBC documentary about this. There's probably going to be many more news stories. There's already other videos that about this right here. The story of a sea monster with 130 razor sharp teeth, the biting force of a T Rex, and a skull measuring two meters. It might sound like the stuff of legend, but this creature really did exist around 75 million years ago, and it was no. called a dinosaur. Not 75 million years ago. This is from the Kimmeridgian. This is way older than that, isn't it? Isn't it? The Pliosaurs were already extinct by that point. Come on, BBC. A fossil of its enormous jaws has been now found off Dorset's Jurassic Coast. Our science yeah, it's editor, from the Jurassic. Rebecca Morell, went yeah. for an exclusive look. Okay. Oh, wow. There you go. It's huge. Unveiling a Jurassic <laughs> sea monster. This is the two meter long skull of a pliosaur, one of yeah. the most fearsome predators the planet has ever seen. Very cool. Big teeth, excellent for stabbing and killing its prey. It doesn't chew its food. For cutting, look at those, it. how sharp the carinae are. Digest, Throws it back yeah. to get in there. And digest the bone and everything. Steve Etches led the efforts to unearth and prepare this so there's Steve Etches, excellent. Beast. So what makes this unique is it's complete. So the lower jaws and the upper skull are meshed together as it would be in life. To find that, I think worldwide, there's hardly any specimens ever found to that level of detail. And if they are, a lot of the bits are missing. Whereas this, although it's slightly distorted, it's got every bone present. Huh. It's one of the best fossils I've ever worked on. I'll never probably work on another one. The snout was discovered by a fossil enthusiast on a beach near Kimmeridge Bay in Dorset. I just found something quite extraordinary. <laughs> it's the jaw of a massive pliosaur. Yep. It's enormous. And so he just found that and he instantly knew what it was. There are some incredible fossil collectors out there on the Isle of Wight, on the Jurassic Coast of England. People kind of following the footsteps of, of Mary Anning. Um, it's, I remember Denver Fowler used to wax poetical about, about the skill and knowledge of some of these, these amateur collectors. He's like, yeah, they know more about these fossils than people in London working at the Natural History Museum. They've got more on the ground experience, more fieldwork know-how more practical knowledge than the people who were employed by the museum in some cases. They are really incredible folks. And that, this was discovered by an amateur collector, by an enthusiast, you know? Yeah. It must have just come out of a cliff up there somewhere. Over the course of weeks, the rest was excavated. A perilous process, with Steve and the team dangling off ropes halfway down a fast eroding cliff face. <laughs> it was all followed by a BBC documentary team. And ah! Yes! This means we're going to see a documentary about this at some point. Ah! In these waters, underneath my feet, lurk the ultimate marine predator, <laughs> the Pliosaur. Oh, man. This gigantic reptile lived 150 million years ago. And is that 8 p.m. New Year's Day on BBC One and I player? Well, well, well. Oh, oh, oh. oh, boy. I can't wait till that. Until I get my. My eyeballs on that. This gigantic reptile lived 150 million years ago. Reaching more than London VPN, there you go, weird adult. Yes. Powered through the water with huge <laughs> paddle like limbs. It would have terrorized the oceans. Yeah. So what we're looking at here is a surface scan. So it is smushed. Of the of the Scientists yeah. have scanned the fossil to try and learn more about its bite with its one hundred and thirty razor sharp teeth. 
They've calculated it had a bite force similar to a T-Rex. Hmm. I think what we're looking at here is the top predator in the environment. You know, this animal had a huge bite. It would have been able to eat pretty much everything else that was around in the water at that time, including some other very large animals as well, other plyosaurs and plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, other marine crocodilians as well too. Yep. Would all if you're be feeling potential. a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. The plesiosaur is my favorite dinosaur. Mr. Tibb, uh, it's a good thing you put a winking kappa in there. Because you have you know very well that plesiosaurs are not dinosaurs. But thank you for the 100 bits there. Thank you kindly. I appreciate the support. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, Lady Mutari says, would it drop its teeth like a shark? It would. Yeah, these are animals that had constantly replacing teeth all the time, just like sharks. Dinosaurs were actually the same way. Again, this is not a dinosaur, but uh, but yeah, yeah. They would have replaced their teeth all the time. Most creatures that have teeth do that. We as mammals are the weird exception, where we've only got, what, two sets of teeth and then we're done? Um, You know, no more teeth? That's it's not necessarily the best system. Uh... Although it works for us mammals, you get that precise occlusion between teeth. These guys went for quantity over quality, and it served them really, really well. Yeah. Prey items for this animal. The dark clay of Dorset's Kimmeridge Bay is rich in fossils. Why is that? 150 million years ago, this whole area would have been a tropical ocean. Yep. And the cliffs behind me were the mud on the sea floor where the body... So when we're talking about that, let me uh, let me show you what we mean. Yeah, when we're talking about this, Dorset looked a lot different back then, 150 million years ago. This is what our planet Earth would have looked like at the time. Africa and South America are still in a tight, loving embrace. North America's up here. Australia, Antarctica. Madagascar and India are all still stuck together down there. There's Asia, and this is Europe. So at this time, there was a warm, kind of almost tropical sea, subtropical sea, that extended across Europe like this. Sea levels rose and fell over millions of years. It says... 75 million years ago, he means 75 million years before 150 million years ago. So this is back in the Triassic period that the marine reptiles have young and marine mammals work. Were there still eggs? They just hatched inside? Silas B. Bank, that's a great question. For some of them, like mosasaurs, we think that is the case. They are what we call ovoviviparous. And that's because... A giant leathery egg found in Antarctica seems to have been from a mosasaur. So we think that the the egg basically hatches within the mother, and then the young swims out, just like we see in a lot of ovoviparous sharks today. But yeah, that leathery egg right there was uh, this is pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it's not just any egg. This egg is the second largest egg of any known animal, alive or dead, and the largest soft-shelled egg ever seen. It's back to about 66 million years ago, just before the dinosaurs became extinct. Yeah, completely unlike a dinosaur egg, though. It's leathery. Um, the most likely culprit, according to researchers, is an extinct marine reptile called a mosasaur. Mosasaurs were giant marine lizards. Different from pliosaurs, different from plesiosaurs. Uh, anyway. 
It's interesting stuff. Um, yeah, but we've got evidence of other marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs. I see H, H T H Y. So you are. We have direct evidence that ichthyosaurs gave birth to live young. Because we have fossils of that, literally showing that. This, I think, is Stenopterygius, which is uh, a well-known ichthyosaur genus. And there is a baby right there. This is not a fossil, like... The mother may or may not have died while giving birth. It could be that she died while almost ready to give birth, and then during decomposition, the embryo, the fetus kind of slid out like that. But yeah. Yeah. Pretty amazing, right? Yeah. Pretty neat. And then we also have... Plesiosaurs. With young preserved inside of them. So this is a polycotylid plesiosaur. This might be Delicorincops, I'm not sure. Her head is right there. Right here. We've got one flipper, two flippers in the front. We've got the hips right there. Ilium, ilium, hind leg, hind leg or hind flipper. And there, highlighted in yellow, are the bones of a juvenile. We don't think she ate that. We think that's her baby. Because it's the same animal, you know? So, pretty cool. So we also now have good evidence that plesiosaurs gave birth to live young, too. Yeah. This is a short-necked plesiosaur, a polycotylid. These guys evolved after the pliosaurs went extinct. So it's not a pliosaur. Short-necked plesiosaurs evolved multiple times. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff, right? Yeah. Anyway. Let's get back to this. These prehistoric sea creatures were buried. And Alexander Morrison, they almost certainly gave live birth, I think. Alexander. Of years. It's only now, yeah. as anyway. crumble, that these fossilized skeletons are finally being revealed. The exact location where the pliosaur's head was found is a closely guarded secret. The team believes the rest of the skeleton is still embedded in the cliffs. I'll stake my life and the rest of the animal is there, that's for sure. Really so, should come out because it's in a very rapidly eroded environment. This part of the cliff is going back by feet a year. And it won't be very long before the rest of it sort of drops out and it gets lost. So it would be advantageous to Welcome, do Darklander. because the opportunity is once in a lifetime. The pliosaur will be put on display in Dorset in the new year. And yep. it will bring scientists from all around the world to study it. Pretty to learn extraordinary. More about this monster of the seas. That's so exciting. It lived in all those millions of years ago. And it's going to be so cool to find some more of this critter, you know? In Dorset. Yeah, you can see why this is making headlines all over the place. There are, of course, new scientific publications in the world of paleontology just about every single day. Most of them don't garner headlines like this because they're not. They're not as extravagant. They're not as spectacular as this. You know? How cool is that? How cool is that? We'll see if maybe we can find... Let's protect our fossils. One more. If they're removed, America loses them forever. And Lady Fiend, holy cow, thank you for your continued support. I really do appreciate that, Lady Fiend. I really, really do. Thank you for keeping, uh, keeping me here on the air. Oh, yeah. Uh, was that, was that two alerts for Lady Fiend? Well, if it was, you deserve it. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And, uh, um, can we find another headline here? Or uh, another video? Excuse me. It used its intimidating size, strength, and... Rip. I don't know if we'll watch this whole thing, but we'll, uh... So we gotta get into Thursday Birds Day here, too. 
I'm standing in the Etches collection in Kimmeridge in Dorset, the new home to the skull of a giant sea monster. Not a dinosaur, but a marine reptile that scientists are agreeing could have beaten T-Rex in a fight. The giant sea monster in question is- No, it couldn't have beaten T-Rex in a fight. It didn't live in the same time or the same place. Who told her that? Somebody's pulling this lady's leg. Um... <sighs> Also, this critter lived in the ocean. Tyrannosaurus lived on land. I suppose in the ocean. If somehow they could travel through time and travel across the world, then yeah, this animal could have beaten T-Rex in a fight in the ocean. But on land, you know who I'm giving that, uh, uh, who I'm placing my bets on. Yeah. Oh, boy. Is a pliosaur. An enormous a Darklander says, because most people only know a T-Rex. I mean, sort of, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it is annoying to me, too. Darklander, you might also feel the same way, but isn't it kind of annoying how everybody always goes on about, oh, T-Rex, T-Rex, T-Rex. There are so many other theropod dinosaurs you could be talking about, you know? Uh, I wish that just half of the attention T-Rex got was distributed to other really interesting theropod dinosaurs. Because holy cow, are there some really cool ones. Some really cool ones. Yeah. Tom Pliosaurus is named by my next There you go, Tommy Flagus. <laughs> Valiant Cheese says, this thing flopping around on land? I mean... That was a plot line. In this. Very. In Walking with Dinosaurs. That's you streptospondylus there. Alive. His enormous jaws are lethal. So yeah, um here we go. One day the Um Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if the fight's in the water, and somehow you could transport these creatures through time and space, then yeah, fight's in the water, I I guess you gotta give it to the, uh, the Pliosaur. If it's on land, you give the fight to the T-Rex. Marine Obviously. ...that used its intimidating size, strength, and teeth to snatch ichthyosaurs in the ocean around 150 million years ago. This new specimen, believed to have been around 12 meters 12 in, meters. in total, hmm. is thought to be a new species marking a discovery of huge academic potential that all began with the discovery cool. of a fossil snout on a beach in Dorset. Now it's found a new home at the Etches Collection. I'm here to speak to Steve Etches and Chris Moore, arguably the stars of a new series from David Attenborough and the BBC, huh. about the discovery of a giant pleosaur skull halfway up a cliff. It wasn't easy getting it out, and we want to hear how it went. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Giant sea monster. Yeah, I'll give you a link to this. We're not going to watch the whole thing here. Um, yeah, because you know what? We got to do Thursday birthday still. And hello, hello to you too, Harissa. Welcome back. How are you doing? Everybody, it is time our Thursday birthday our first Thursday birthday in 2 weeks holy cow you excited for birthday there valiant cheese as we know birds are the last living dinosaurs since birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs that means that they are dinosaurs. They are the last dinosaurs still surviving today. The only ones that survived that mass extinction period. That mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period. 66 million years ago. And it's on Thursdays that we remember this and we celebrate our feathered friends that we find all around us. So without further ado, let's get into Thursday Bird's Day here. <laughs> Hold on, something's coming, something's coming out of here. Look, there's a bird, dude. It knows what's good. 
I'm telling you, I just heard it inside. <laughs> Thursday Birds Day. Birds are all around us in everyday life. But most of the time we hardly even notice them. Thursday Birds Day is a step toward correcting this oversight. Do you want to be part of Thursday Birds Day? I don't know. Here's how you can contribute. Go outside during the week and pay special attention to the birds around you. See if you can take a picture of a bird. It doesn't have to be a good picture, any old photo will do. Upload the picture to the Discord, and we will discuss it on Thursday. Simple as that. Thursday Birds Day is an invitation to go outside and appreciate the grandeur of the natural world. It's a reminder that, since birds are theropods, dinosaurs still enrich our daily lives. It's great! And finally, it's a celebration of the amazing history of life on our planet. So, happy Thursday Birds Day! Well, welcome, welcome to Thursday Birds Day, everyone. I hope you're as excited as I am. We're gonna go over some of these extant theropod photos that members of this community have posted to the Discord. We're gonna start off. Holy cow, is it. Is it been since November 30th? Mayor of Space has got a mystery bird from the aviary at the Detroit Zoo. All the way from exotic Detroit. De Detroit? De Detroit? How do you say that? Very cool, Mayor of Space. Very yellow. Majestic Feathered Mango. There you go, Valiant Cheese. <laughs> Making me hungry. I don't eat birds, but I do eat mangoes. And uh, I like the yellow heart there. That's good. <laughs> and Green Herring says, looks like that's a, their Tavita Golden Weaver. What a neat herb. Well, well, well. Green Herring, once again, spitting facts here. Good stuff. And it was all yellow. There you go, space. Except for the beak and the eye, but that's not part of the song. Tavetta Golden Weaver. Very nice, Mayor of Space. Very nice. Let's take a look at that photo. Very yellow. Yeah. Golden Weaver. I believe you can get me through the night. Activated Complex? I don't know that song. No. Not batting 100 here, sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Thanks for posting, Mayor Space. Excellent. And thank you, Green Herring. Although they are classified as songbirds, the Tevedo weavers are very noisy and the sounds are not enjoyable for human ears. Wow, how dare you, Detroit Zoo? <laughs> ah, yeah. Check out Wayne's World. I've seen Wayne's World multiple times. Activated, I don't remember that. Bird slander from the zoo itself. You know, Xander Jiggles, sometimes it's the ones closest to you. Dinosaur Dave has got... I looked up roundest bird, and I don't know what I expected, but I'm crying. Look at it. It's called a bearded reedling. Look at them. They are so spherical, so round. Why is your face in the middle of your body, sir? I cannot believe this bird is real. <laughs> uh... Bearded reedling. Let's look them up. Yeah, they get pretty round. And they can do the splits. Holy moly, look at that. 
borb indeed, Golganek. That's... It's a bird orb. It's a borb. It's... It's a bird orb. Yeah. What are they related to? Bearded Reedlings. Let's look them up on the Tree of Life. Bearded Reedling. Also called... Also called what? That's unexpected. Bearded Parrot Bill? That's interesting. Uh, passerine bird. Is this the same thing? I'm not 100% sure it is. Nope. It is. <laughs> Related to crocodiles, probably. Well, all birds are, Mayor Space. Nope, shoot. I wasn't trying to do that. They're related to dinosaurs, first and foremost, because they evolved from dinosaurs. But outside of dinosaurs, which are extinct now, except for birds, crocodiles are the closest living relatives of birds, as uh, Alexander Morrison will be keen to tell you. Yeah. I wanted to guess what I thought it was related to, but I was afraid to say the word in chat. Wise, X-Men, wise. Yeah. It is related to... kind of bird? Tits. That's the kind of bird. Very nice, Dinosaur Dave. Thank you. And fa la 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 the la nina says, It is not a recent pick by any means, but since it's Christmas time and my life is absolutely abnormally busy right now, here's a pick of my old cockatiel, Woodstock. Great name. The night he joined my family. He was a gift from Santa, and he was my best pal for many, many years. Do you have an a you have actual photographic evidence of Santa Claus, though, Lenina? I feel like you're burying the lead here. Huh. Yes, he was definitely a male. Uh oh. Did he make that obvious? This was his juvenile plumage. Um, very nice. Lenina, that is super cute. Super cute. But, uh... Yeah. Again, you've got actual photographic evidence of a mythical creature in this in this. That's nuts. You should sell this photograph, Lenina. Uh, that's a. I believe this is what the kids call a cryptid right here, and you have actual photographic evidence. Holy cow! The International Cryptozoological Society. I believe they, they'll they give you a cash reward, right? Anyway. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Dinosaur Dave says, Aussie birds at my parents' place. Videos of a scaly and rainbow lorikeet stinging and playing and flying. No close-ups with a rose, rosella and a kookaburra in the two images. It would help if I turned the sound on, huh? Very nice. That sounds very Australian there. Very Australian. Yeah. Containment breach. Well, welcome, welcome. Tech priest and ponage variety. Howdy, howdy. How you doing? Welcome to Thursday Birds Day here on Paleontologizing. Did you come in prior to a big raid or something? Uh, Tony's my baby says everybody knows cryptozoology is more profitable than regular zoology. You're probably not wrong. Um, yeah, in the same way that UFO hoaxes are more profitable than looking for new asteroids or meteorites. Anyway, you've been a lurker for a bit. Well, tech priest. Thanks for breaking containment. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Uh, 
I believe Attack Rack hosted you. Her account is like banned or something? That's odd. Huh. It's probably a glitch, I'm guessing. Yeah. Anyway. And yeah, very nice. Beautiful parrot like bird there. And a laughing kookaburra. Beautiful. Yeah. And Cheeseness has got another Aussie bird, the gray butcher bird. Ooh, we've seen these before. Nice. We have a particular subspecies down here in Tasmania Practicus Tarcatus Pinearus. Which isn't found anywhere else. Like our magpies and currawongs, they're members of the Artemidae family. They have complex songs. In my mind, it's like a little Australian magpie caroling, but more exuberant and energetic. I'm breaking the one picture rule to share the differences between adults and juveniles. I'm pretty sure this is a female. And one of her babies who recently left the nest. The one I'm assuming is the dad is in a nearby tree. The second sibling is on a higher branch. He's a little bigger. Which I think is the primary distinction characteristic between the sexes. Yeah. Most birds are sexually dimorphic in size only. Um, and many others in plumage, too. But yeah. Note the juvenile's shorter gray beak with the pronounced hook. Fluffy baby feathers almost give the impression that the adults have a bigger eye-to-head ratio. Jesus, this is great. I love the text here. And look at that, that hook on the end of the beak. That is... Let me embiggen this to show it off. Check out that hook right there. The reason they're called butcher birds. Oh man. Very cool. And uh here's the juvenile. Let's protect our fossils because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Das Collective, did you just convert a gift sub into a recurring sub there? Because if so, holy cow, do I appreciate that, Das Collective. I really, really do. And you're helping us get to our, uh, to our Partner Plus push goal. Thank you, thank you, Dust Collective. I really appreciate that. Thank you kindly. Appreciate you. There are a few more photos in this thread of the whole family. Content warning, there's some not very graphic carrion feeding going on in the first post hidden by default. They're generally, they generally eat lizards and insects, but in this case, from a dad scavenging a bird carcass for his young. Holy cow, that's really cool, Cheeseness. Thank you so much for sharing. Backyard natural history. This is top tier stuff and a beautiful Thursday birds they post. Thank you there, Cheeseness. Fantastic, fantastic. Hook is perfect for grabbing lizards. Please stop eating my lizard friends. Yeah, I know, right? Valiant Cheese, I love lizards too. I don't want to see them get eaten. Uh, thank you, Valiant Cheese. Thank you very much. Good stuff. And Tarquin says, do extinct birds count? I went to the Page Museum at La Brea. Very cool. And found a beautiful display of fossil birds and found it in Qatar. It includes the iconic Teratornus Mariamai. Yes, in Indeed. Yeah. Merriam's a giant condor. Teratornus Merriamai. Immortalized not just in the tar, but also in this famed painting by Charles R. Knight with those giant teratorns there. Very cool. And they're named Teratornus Mariamai after John C. Merriam, who is a, uh, a paleontologist in the early 20th century. I think maybe prior president of the University of California Museum of Paleontology. This particular image here in the round like this was on the wall is still on the wall, different wall now, at the Museum of Paleontology. When I was in high school, this was on the wall in the back room where I worked as a volunteer at the museum. Every morning, I'd walk into this room and I would see this, uh, this portrait of John C. Merriam up there. 
And the weird thing about this is... It just has this piercing... Piercing gaze there. Those eyes stare back at you. And they follow you... Around the room. And most days it would just be me and him working there in the back room. This extraordinary group of animals that have ever appeared on this planet. Womp Womp said... No, wrong sound. There we go. Womp Womp, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Here's another one. Thanks for following. It's good to have you here. And Womp Womp says, Sup, it's Harissa Child. Harissa Child, Womp Womp. It's great to have you here. That's who you are. Thank you, thank you for the follow. I appreciate you. I do. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, we're doing Thursday Birds Day right now, Charcon. But in talking about this Thursday Birds Day bird, Teratornis Mariamai, we're briefly talking about John C. Mariam, who was. Let's see. John C. Merriam may have been the first president of the museum. There's Annie Montague Alexander, who founded the Museum of Paleontology. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, yeah. Merriam was an exceptional researcher, fossil collector, and prolific author of many papers. Uh, did some work at La Brea, etc., etc. Anyway. Never forget this picture because it was up in the back room there and his eyes would just follow you around. So every morning I would come to work there, I would say, Good morning, Dr. Merriam. Because he just watches you all day. Something about that portrait, those eyes. Really something. Yeah. And uh, this bird, Teratornis mariamai, now extinct. Giant Teratorn is named after him. Uh, um, dinosaur David's got more Aussie dinosaurs for us. Dinosaur David's on fire lately. Very nice. Those look like swallows almost. Nice. Bunt has got a woodpecker. There were two of them at my suet feeder, but I'm glad I got this good a picture of one. Woodpecker is that? Is it a flicker? Or is it a hairy woodpecker? I don't know. I've never been very good at woodpeckers. Yeah. Downy woodpecker. Thank you, Green Heron. Appreciate that. Very nice, bud. Very nice. And Charcone, there you are, just in time. Charcone says the dutiful mother, house friend, raised a successful brood in the birdhouse right outside our front door. She would let out a warning call every time we passed by. The chicks would immediately go quiet. Oh, that's so cool. And it's so cool that you picked up on that. That, like, you're cognizant of this bird behavior here. It's really neat. It's really neat. She would let out a warning call every time we passed by. And the chicks would immediately go silent. I'm so proud of her. Wrens can be hard to spot sometimes. But boy, are they loud. Charcone, you managed to get a picture. That's lovely. House friends, where do they show up on our tree of life? Where on the bird branch are the house friends? Nice. Troglodytes. Don't call wrens troglodytes. Who we'll renamed this? That's shots fired, you know. Yeah. Uh, but they are in among the wrens. Wrens. Such a... <laughs> I've always loved that name, Wren. There's something very, very fun about that. Kylo Wren. That has to... Somebody has to have made this joke before, right? Kylo Wren. And yeah, there we go. <laughs> Oh, 
we or we could go in a different direction with it. Yeah, Steam, you idiot. <laughs> Uh Maybe nobody's done that one. Anyway. It's open. Open season. Somebody make that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, Renz, cool birds, and thank you, Charcone. For the, I love the lovely story to go with this, too. That's beautiful. That's some Thursday Birds Day goodness there, if I ever saw any. Yeah. The Dust Collective, that's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Alexander Morrison's got a great white pelican, yes! Photographed at the bird sanctuary neighboring the nearby Moat Marine facility. This big bird is within a pen alongside many other pelicans. Very cool. Do you know... Do you know the story of, uh, of pelicans and Museum of the Rockies and Jack Horner and Bob Makala? Um, shoot. Let me see. Do I have a video here? Um... Back in the day, my old boss, Jack Horner, um, had a good friend, kind of his partner in the field, Bob Makala. There's Jack and Bob Makala long, long time ago. This would have been back in... Uh, 40 years ago. 1988, Bob Makala and I dug up a nest of baby hadrosaurian dinosaurs originally found by Marion Branville. Bob and I referred to them to a new genus and species, Hadrosauri christened Myasaura peoplesorum. I arrived at the site today to mark its 40th anniversary. Um, Bob Makala. But in the serious game of paleontology, much larger mysteries still remain. And, uh,. Ingagus, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. Uh, this is from Jack's book, Dinosaur Lives here. Um, oh, hang on a minute. What's wrong with our webcam? There we go. Yeah. Uh, the book is called Dinosaur Lives by Jack Horner. Good book. Uh, let me read you a little segment from that that has to do with pelicans. There we go. This is one of my favorite stories from this book. Dinosaur 
Thank you, Joshua Sweet. Is it dinosaur lives or dinosaur lives? Yes, Joshua Sweet. Is <laughs> dinosaur lives or dinosaur lives, you know? I like to think it's dinosaur lives, but I guess that's open to interpretation there. Yeah. So... Uh, Um, Bob Makala, uh, passed away. He actually died in a car accident doing field work near the town of Rudyard, Montana. And I'm trying to find the passage here that talks about this. Here we go. Hmm. Bob Mackle was especially fond of the Pelican. One evening early in the 1986 season, I can't recall exactly when or even how the subject came up, he said that if he died sooner rather than later, the moon does exist. And too many Steam games. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Bob Mackle has said that if he did die sooner rather than later, his spirit would always remain close by, watching us through the eyes of a big white pelican. And if I do die, Bob added emphatically, give me a wake. None of that somber stuff. Uh, I remember thinking at the time that were one of us to go early, it would most likely be me. Bob seemed just unstoppable. As a young man, he'd survived Hodg Hodg Hodgkin's disease, one of the first in the country to do that. His passion for fossil collecting was insatiable. He wouldn't think twice about walking 20 miles under a blistering sun or jackhammering limestone for 20 days straight. And Camp Bob was a dynamo. Teacher, father figure, keeper of fieldwork stories and traditions, he initiated new crew members into the ways of paleontological excavation as well as into the secrets of living comfortably outdoors. Invariably, Bob was one of the last to go to sleep at night and the first to wake up in the morning, busily preparing supplies and equipment, filling water containers, getting everyone ready for another long day of digging. And then he died in a car accident out in the field. Um, I'm skipping forward in the book, but as Bob had requested, we marked his death by ce celebrating his life, his and ours. On July 1st, we held a wake for him at his house in Rudyard, uh, the small town 100 miles east of Cutbank, where he had taught high school high school science since graduating from the University of Montana. But it wasn't easy steering clear of the somber stuff that he'd always considered a wasteful distraction. So the book goes on, you know, he's talking about remembering Bob. We're always on the lookout for great blue herons and especially pelicans. Imagining that Bob was somewhere nearby, standing watch over the digs, made our newly diminished work easier to bear. I thought that was going to be a little bit, you know, put a little bow on that, but that's not quite how it's written. But anyway, every time I think of, and every time I see white pelicans like this, Alexander Morrison, I remember that passage from that book, and I remember Bob Mackle. I never had a chance to meet him. There was another Bob, Bob Harmon, whom Jack met, I think, not long after the passing of Bob Makala. Bob Harmon was himself a dynamo in the field and kind of a, a legendary figure. Well, good Bobs indeed, Claire Burr. Yeah. And I've got Bob, I've got bird stories about Bob Harmon. But we'll get into that another time. You know? Anyway, thank you, Alexander Morrison. White pelicans, they're considered good luck in the field by Jack Horner, and I remember him talking about that at one point. Big fan of pelicans myself. Thanks for posting. What else have we got? Charlie's Dragon has got a Eurasian bullfinch. Well, well, well. At the bird feeder. Here are some... Oh, uh, here... 
Those are the Christmas birds, not red robins. The robins have given up on Norwegian weather long ago. <laughs> Very nice, Charlie's Dragon. Eurasian bullfinch. Where do they show up on the Tree of Life, I wonder? They're finches, aren't they? Bullfinch? Sometimes finches aren't finches. Eurasian bullfinches. Oh, there's multiple species. Interesting. Yeah, good bobs and good borbs. There you go, Charlie's Dragon, yeah. And finch! There you go, Birds of the Dawn. Yes, indeed. So there are multiple species within the genus Pyrhula. Just like he posted there, Charlie's Dragon. These are Pyrhula Pyrhula. Which is gonna be this one right there. Very nice. Very nice. It's kind of amazing that these little birds can survive Norwegian winters. Pretty cool, Charlie's Dragon. Pretty cool. Thank you for posting. Yeah. Dinosaur Dave says, here's another Aussie bird enjoying the native flowers at my parents' place. Who is that? Some sort of parrot? Very nice. This almost looks like an Australian tea tree. Which we have here in California, you know, imported obviously. But very nice there, Dinosaur Dave. Thank you for posting. Uh, and another one. Red-tailed black cockatoo. Yeah, they are noisy, aren't they? Very cool. I seldom see wild parrots unless I'm in San Francisco, and those are cherry-headed conures. They're they're not native. It's so cool to have native parrots, isn't it? One of them is Gallas. Cool, Valley. Yeah, and Green Herring has got, oh, a red-shouldered hawk. Oh, yeah. Here's a red-shouldered hawk doing a very convincing impression of a tree branch. I wasn't 100% certain that, this, that there was a hawk there until I zoomed in. This bird was in full hunter mode, sitting completely still except for their head, which moved back and forth, scanning the ground for food, most likely rodents at this time of year. They also eat frogs and stuff, right? Red-shouldered hawks? A few moments after I took this photo, they spotted something and swooped down into the brush. I did not see them come back up, so it was likely a successful hunt. Well, good for them. I used to see red-shouldered hawks all the time in the San Francisco Presidio. Apparently, that is the place in the United States with the highest concentration of red-shouldered hawks. Not well, let, let's see. Um, uh, red shouldered hawk, they tend to forage along the edges of wet areas. That includes a variety of things ranging from mammals to insects, which it usually searches for a perch. Territorial is found in all forested areas of the Presidio and uses the Presidio as a breeding ground. They're common in the Presidio all year round. And... Yeah, interesting. Um, where are red-shouldered hawks most common? Florida and California. I'm pretty sure San Francisco's Presidio. I've been told... They have the highest concentration of red-shouldered hawks anywhere in the world. Right there within spitting distance of the Golden Gate Bridge, which is pretty magical. The Presidio in this image is basically everything that's dark green there. 
that is the San Francisco Presidio. This is an area that's like five times larger than Central, than New York Central Park, I think. And that's not even the only big green space in San Francisco. You also have Golden Gate Park, which is like two or three times as big as Central Park in New York. The Presidio is a magical place, and I worked there for two years. Pretty awesome. I love the Presidio. One of my favorite places in the whole world. And Alfie Entropy. What, what is this noise right here? What do I hear? That sounds like... Dinosaur. A dinosaur, Alfie Entropy. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologize. It's good to have you here. Um, but yeah, yeah. They eat frogs and lizards as well. Interesting, Green Heron. Anyway, red-shouldered hawks are cool critters. That's a red-tailed hawk. We're looking for the red-shouldered hawk. There we go. David Merp. Brown from Lyco Birds. Lyco In this Birds. video, I will teach you the basics of identifying red-shouldered hawks. Huh. The red-shouldered hawk is in the Budio genus, along with species like red-tailed hawk and broad-winged hawk. Red hmm. shoulders are smaller than red tails, but slightly larger than broad wings. Adult red-shouldered hawks a broad have an hawk orange is. body and black tail with multiple thin white bands. I need to get better at my raptor identification. Adults also have a dark trailing edge to the wing. The huh. shoulder area does not have the dark patagial bars that red tails have. Hmm. For the first year, red-shouldered hawks are in juvenile plumage, which is more plain with a white body and brown streaking. Huh. The tail has thin brown bands. Red-shouldered hawks have right five here. feathers at the wingtip, right? giving them a blunt, huh. squared-off shape compared to the more pointed wingtips of broad-winged hawks. An iron bark? That's nuts. The I'm going to see if I can find that one the squirrel. Has a bold black and white pattern. Anyway, interesting stuff. I'll share this video with you, too. But red-shouldered hawks got a special place in my heart after uh, seeing so many of them in the Presidio. They are very cool critters. They really are. Um, thank you for posting, Green Herring. Wonderful as usual. And let's take a look at that gorgeous photo. Look at that. It does look like a tree branch there. And I'm sure it did to its unsuspecting prey as well. It became an unsuspecting bee. Uh, and you found it, Ironbark? Excellent. Cool. It's funny, I didn't see a lot of squirrels there in the Presidio either. I wonder if the red-shouldered hawks really uh, either ate them or just made them very furtive. Very sneaky. Because I would not see squirrels frequently at all in the Presidio. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Charlie's Dragon, you and me both. I'm not great at identifying birds in flight. Mizart Rules has got some theropods with attitude. Canada geese there. Branta canadensis. Do I have that right? Yeah. Good honk friends. Or honk fiends. Valiant cheese. Depends on your point of view. Friends or fiends. Geese have been called both. I'm sure they've earned both titles. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I'm yet to meet a goose that didn't enjoy the company of. I'm glad you're a friend of geese, Valley and Cheese. I'm glad. Uh, some people are terrified of geese. Um, and uh, Tech Priest says, if you've got a problem with Canada geese, you've got a problem with me. I suggest you let that one marinate. <laughs> Uh Understood, Tech Priest. I personally am very fond of Canada geese. I think they're really cool. Yeah. Um, but thank you, Miss Abet, Miss Art Rules. Appreciate that, Miss Abet. Good stuff. Good stuff. And Birds of Denon says, Finch. Zebra Finch. That's beautiful, Birds of Denon. An indoor bird. 
Gotta love it. Yeah. Letter Kenny. Nice. Tech Priest. Nice. 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 Yeah. Um. Yeah. Did you see that the geese pitter patter all over the place when they're walking around, Engine Nerd? Sure, if you want me to? What's that a reference to? What am I missing here? Uh, yeah. Anyway, very cute finch. Thank you, thank you, Birds of Dead On, for sharing your dinosaur with us. Uh, and Cheez It says they're so nice. Be able to take black cockatoos down here? Oh, gorgeous. That is a very nice looking bird. Holy cow, a truck boat. And what a great photo. Lovely, lovely. They're very shy and sound like creaky barn doors. That's great. That's great. And its evolution has got a cute Lusocarbo Bransfieldiensis. Telling me some history of its evolution. That's wonderful. Is this. Is that... Is that an albatross? Or is it a cormorant? This isn't one of those flightless cormorants, is it? That would be super, super cool. Is this one of Darwin's flightless cormorants? Well, let's look them up. Antarctic Shag. Oh, very cool. Nice. That's super neat. Okay. Um, we're going to jump to a different Shag, and then we'll see if we can find the same one. I'm sure they've got multiple common names. Yeah, it's just a chick. The big ones can f can fly. Very cool, it's evolution. Very, very cool. All right. So shags and cormorants are closely related. They are part of the same, uh, same clade. Very cool. Yeah. Double-crested cormorants, those are the ones that we have here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We also have Brant's Cormorant. No. Really neat. Really neat. Um, which, what, is there another common name for these? So known as the Imperial Cormorant. Okay, that's what it is. I saw that over here. It's probably known as the Imperial Check. Yeah. Very cool. It is sometimes considered conspecific with the Imperial Shag. Okay. Lisa Carbo, Atrisaps. Take a look at these critters. They're beautiful animals. These are adults. I think they're courting here. Oh. <laughs> very cool. Very, very cool. Probably the most striking of all the cormorants is the Imperial Cormorant, or as it is known to some as the Imperial Shag. Huh. 
This serrated bill is good for behavioral duties, but it's also really good for catching fish. Hmm. It comes from a group of blue-eyed cormorants, of which several subspecies have been elevated to species. Interesting as we are. <laughs> this species is from the That's coastal funny. areas of southern South America. Birds are funny sometimes. It is monogamous and forms breeding colonies of hundreds of pairs. Despite its reliance on safety and numbers. I love that when they, they like it almost reminds me of like the droop snoot on a on a uh, a Concorde jet. And the way that they like droop their head like that as they're about to land here. It was such a weird posture. Look, look at this. Going, Despite its reliance like on that. safety and numbers, <laughs> many eggs and chicks are eaten by skuas and sheath bills both avian predators of the southern ocean. Huh. Cormorants are excellent divers and feed mostly on the Argentine anchoita, a species of anchovy off the coast of southern South America. They also eat crustaceans, bristle worms, marine snails, and octopuses. Bristle worms, I think, are also known as uh, polychaete worms, right? Skuas are always trying to get a free lunch. Is, no, is that a different? That's a different group. ranges are close Sorry. to the shore. Worms are super diverse. Imperial cormorants can dive as Probably deep not as 50 meters in order to feed. After diving and feeding for 30 minutes, they have to return to land in order to dry their plumage. Imperial cormorants can also be found on inland lakes in the foothills of the Andes. Very cool. Here, a mother forcefully feeds her youngster, who by now is an adolescent and seems to resist his mother's <laughs> desire to pass on some delicious pets. Oh, pests. Sorry, Aaron Brack. Yeah. Anyway, cool stuff. Thank you for posting there, It's Evolution. What a great photo. Man, is that a big bird. And that's you there too, right? Thank you so much for posting. This is a great photo. This makes me smile. This is wonderful. Um, yeah. It's funny how juvenile birds are like nearly as big as the adults. Dinosaurs were not like that. Like... With, with non-avian dinosaurs, I hasten to clarify. They got so much bigger that it would take years for them to reach adult size, even growing extremely quickly. With birds, it's like, bow. You go from hatchling to adult size within less than a year, you know? Uh, ready to take some blood samples. Oh, very cool, it's evolution. What kind of study were you doing? What, what sort of data were you collecting? I guess, what was your research question? This is really cool. Thank you for sharing. Oh, it makes me, makes me happy. What kind of bird is that? That is a juvenile imperial shag. Saggy iguana. And population genetics. Very cool. It's evolution. Very, very cool. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Hope says, do you... Not sure what you're talking about there, Pope, but uh, I got news for you. We're all fish. So are birds. And researchers. Tetrapods are a kind of fish, you know? Including the Imperial Shag. Including all birds. Belong to a group called... Dipno tetrapodomorpha. Which are lungfishes and tetrapods. Yeah. 
We are Sarcopterygians, which are lobe fin fishes. Lobe fin fishes, including tetrapods. So lemurs and frogs and birds, opossums and lizards and coelacanths, and us, me and you. We're all lobe fin fishes. It's pretty cool to think about, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Pope, is that a... Is this a song or something I'm not aware of? I'm, I'm failing to get the reference. Anyway, welcome back. It's good to have you here. Let's continue with our Thursday Birds Day Birds. Thank you, It's Evolution. This is good stuff. Alexandra McRae Art, is this a European robin? Oh, that's beautiful. Sorry, it couldn't be a photo, but based on a photograph, this... What do you mean, sorry, it couldn't be a photo? What do, you, what do you mean, sorry? This is gorgeous. Holy cow, this is incredible. I mean, holy moly. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Um, thank you for sharing. That is gorgeous. What was your medium here? Is this... Uh, pencil? Is it watercolors? It's so skillfully... Is it... Is it art markers? What? It's gauche. Very cool, Dark Lantern. That is gorgeous. Holy cow. Um, let's give a paleo salute to that. Beautiful. Yeah. That's amazing. Nicely done. Holy cow. Very talented. You were very talented. Thank you for sharing with us. And Layer Trop says, I believe it's a welcome swallow, this one here. Well, it's certainly welcome for Thursday Birds Day. Beautiful. Swallows are such cool birds. I think they're new in my area. Same house for years, but I've never seen these birds dancing through the air before. Normally birds fly. These things are like acrobats. Apparently they're hunting insects. Yeah, they catch insects on the wing. Swallows, they remind me of, uh, they remind me of Harrier Jets. The way that they, they bank around turns and stuff like that. Turns T-U-R-A, not turn like the bird. Um, yeah. They are... Very aerobatic. Take a look. This one drinking like that. He's got long wings. But something about those swept wings just reminds me of like a Harrier jump jet. I don't know why a Harrier jump jet in particular, but they really remind me of that. Yeah. Extraordinary animals. Yeah. <laughs> ah, they're so beautiful. Anyway, great photo there, Layer Trop, and thank you for sharing. Is this a barn swallow? I'm not sure what kind of swallow this is. We've got at least three species here in the East Bay. San Francisco Bay Area. Barn swallows, green swallows, and tree swallows, I think. And uh, Nova Plain, thank you for dropping in. Thanks for your follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And yeah, African or European swallow. <laughs> Charlie's dragon. Uh, yeah. A snowy egret on the beach. I miss my snowy egrets. I uh, there is there were two snowy egrets that I would see almost every night when I'd go out for walks at my old apartment, and I miss seeing them. 
I don't have snowy egrets in my neighborhood. My new neighborhood after I moved. To my knowledge, I don't... I haven't seen any yet. But, uh... Yeah. But, cool stuff. Um, snowy egrets. Cool birds, Neil. Cool birds. Uh, I used to watch these guys catch fish all the time by my old apartment. I will miss that, but it's, uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, miscreation. Says, I took this in front of my house back in May. A blue-faced honey eater. From Queensland, Australia. What a gorgeous picture, and what a gorgeous bird. Holy cow. The blue-faced honey eater. I wonder if they're related to honey creepers, like in, uh... Like in Hawaii. Blue-faced honey eater. Oh, they've got a cool genus name. Yeah. Entomizon cyanatus. That means blue face. It's funny, the species name is, uh... Blue face or blue eyes? Eaters, honey eaters. Honey eaters. The obscure honey eater. <laughs> Very fitting that the obscure honey eater. No photo. <laughs> it delivers what it promises. And Miss Creation says, I was testing my new zoom lens at the time. That is beautiful work there. Holy cow. Also, welcome to paleontologizing. I haven't seen you here before. But, um... What a gorgeous photograph. That is extraordinary, Miss Creation. This is top tier stuff. I mean, again. Extraordinary. Really, really beautiful. Excellent. This is Fantastic. Um, Miss Creation says, I watch a bit, but not a chatter. Well, thank you for posting this gorgeous, gorgeous photo. This is extraordinary. Thank you. Spared no expense, says Mayor Space. I mean, this is probably an expensive lens, I guess, and a really nice camera. But it takes more than just an expensive lens and a nice camera. Sovet 1998 gifted a tier 1 sub to Miscreation78. They you, have given 12 gift subs in the channel. Thank you very, very much for that. I do appreciate it. And I'm sure Miscreation appreciates that as well. No ads until halfway through the new year. Thank you, Miss Yvette. Miscreation, thank you for, for being part of this community. First as a lurker, and now as a subscriber. Albeit a gifted one, but that still counts, you know? Welcome. It's so good to have you here. What a what a gorgeous bird. Holy moly. Huh. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, Iron Bark says, grab this from the car as I was delivering mail. Red shouldered hawk here in South Carolina, Iron Bark. Holy cow, we are witnessing some dinosaur and mammal violence here. That's also an extraordinary photo as an action shot. Look at that. That's big prey for a red-shouldered hawk, too. Holy moly. This is like... That squirrel probably weighs close to what this hawk weighs, if not more. Um, Yowza. Yowza, yowza, yowza. This is like watching a lion take down a zebra. But, uh... A little closer to home, I guess. Yeah. A whole squirrel. Yeah, it didn't even cut the squirrel in half first. Pally and cheese. I don't think they do that very often. Yeah, he dropped it twice trying to carry it. I... Again. Formidable predators. Uh, hawks and eagles. Acepterids are 
In fact, that actually reminds me of, uh, do we have a clip of how formidable, formidable they can be as, uh, as predators? I believe we do. Uh, here it is. Don't mind the countdown. I'm going to zip through that. Allosaurus, ancient predecessor Let's of talk the creations. Mighty hunter of the Jurassic Age. Giant meat eater with long dagger-like teeth. Lestat Creations, thank you so much for the five months of support. I really appreciate that. Um, another formidable meat eater right here. Uh, here, I, I believe we also have a clip of uh, what formidable hunters these critters can be. Anyway, yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes dinosaurs just eat mammals like that. And that's what we saw here. Um, salute to that squirrel. Hopefully it also accomplished some sort of important mission, like uh, jewelry disposal within an active volcano before succumbing to uh, dinosaur diet here. But yeah, yeah. An incredible photo there. That's that sometimes mammals eat birds. We don't talk about that, Charlie's Dragon. <laughs> oh, but Iron Bark, very nice. That's that's really impressive. Holy cow. Yeah. Anyway, and Arisu, red-bellied woodpecker, also a red head on that woodpecker. That is so cool. You got that camera feeder. That's super, super neat. And it... It's got a piece of corn there. Don't you hate it when you get corn stuck in your beak? Well, woodpeckers don't seem to find that to be a problem. Yeah. Um... It's pretty cool. This is pretty cool. Um... These are... <laughs> I had to get me one of these... These bird feeders with the camera attached. That's so cool, Risa Dego. That's so cool. Holy moly. Um, good stuff. You've got to sleep, Dar Darklander. Thank you for being here. And uh, you get some sleep. Sweet dreams. Dream of dinosaurs in a good way. And I hope to see you around. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the community. Risu, this is beautiful. I appreciate it. Super cool. Uh, um, Saggy Iguana. You made this with charcoal? Also, hi, Danny. Well, hi, Saggy Iguana. This is gorgeous. Look at that raven. Quoth the raven. What a piece. Holy cow. Beautiful art piece here. Such talented chatters here. Both with photography and with bird watching and identification and with art. This is this is and 
what a perfect subject for a charcoal illustration there, Sagiwana. This is this is really something. Can I can I ask you a question, Sagiwana? Um The highlights that you did here on the eyes and on the uh the dorsal surface of the beak and the head. Do you have like a light colored charcoal that you did for that? Or is this just negative space in here where you just didn't make this as dark? Um Oh, a mono zero race. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. This is beautiful. It's beautiful. Very talented. Um, holy moly, this is gorgeous. Wow, I'm thoroughly impressed. This is one of the best Thursday Birds Day showings we've had in a good while. This is fantastic. Yeah. This community is incredible. I agree, Lenina. It's so good to be doing Thursday Birds Day again. Last Thursday, I was moving, so we didn't have Thursday Birds Day. I didn't stream that day. Holy moly, is it good to be back. And what a wonderful way to wrap this up. Sag Iguana, thank you so much. Big paleo salute to everyone who has submitted a Thursday Birds Day picture. I'm looking forward to next Thursday Birds Day. Oh, and shoot, I've got my own Thursday Birds Day bird. We'll wrap up with that. Um, from my new neighborhood. And it's therefore likely that we're here today because Reverend of by Twitch. the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. Yep, Reverend of Twitch, 11 months, thank you for helping me not go massively extinct myself over the past 11 months. Thanks for supporting me, putting food on my table with that subscription. Thank you, thank you. Um, here we go. We have got a bird watching, some, well, being watched by a cat. This is one of my new landlords here. <laughs> she, uh, she discovered my desk yesterday. Or was it this morning? I forget. I think it was yesterday. But yeah, now that's not my Thursday birthday bird. My Thursday birthday bird is well, you tell me, chat. What sort of bird is this? I know what it is. What do you think it is? Hmm. Harper Lee would be proud. Um, maybe. Ostrich, not quite mayor space. And not a chicken, uh, great Sir Nico, but thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> um, yeah. And your number one favorite bird? Charcon. It is indeed a mockingbird. Um... You got it right. That's the correct gong, because I don't have a... I need to get a correct sound effect. So for now, that's what we get. Um, it's not a Ford Ranger. <laughs> More reliable than a Ford Ranger, probably, Amber Vix. Um, you know, one of these... Yeah, one of these bad boys... This will go for more than uh, 110,000 miles. Yeah. And the gear shift on it won't break as easily either. I used to drive Ford Rangers for a living. It's a good truck. I like the size of it. Like, that was good about it, but man, build quality wasn't excellent. Uh, it's your state's bird in like 12 other states? Lenina, we'll have to do a, a state bird stream at some point, too. That'll be fun. We can maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe do a tier list of the state birds. It'll be fun because there won't be 50 of them because there's like 30 different states that all have the same state birds as each other. But anyway, yeah. The markings look way different, says Tony is my baby. It's, uh, yeah, it's a weird angle. Yeah, there you go. 
Mockingbird. Very nice. Yeah, Robin Battle Royale. Yeah, Robins, Mockingbirds, Northern Cardinals, and Western Meadowlarks. They can all duke it out. Uh, only one state will be victorious, says Risa Dago. Yeah, that'll be fun. Um. Anyway, with that having been said, holy cow, it is time... To wrap up tonight's stream, I've been going for four and three quarters hours. Started late. It's getting late. I need to go have some dinner myself. So, it's time to wrap things up here. Here is another bird to run our credits over. Archaeopteryx, in fact. There we go. And there's our tunes and there's our credits. Beautiful. Don't go away just yet. We... We're gonna go raid right into somebody else doing something cool on Twitch. We'll see just what. Hmm. Um. Let's see. It has been. Oh yeah, for Thursday Birds Day, we're gonna go right into Hoot House livestream. We're gonna see some more birds. Raid Hoot House live stream. There we go, it worked. We're gonna see a live owl in a box. A barn owl, not a box owl, a barn owl. They don't have to live in a barn. In California, sometimes all you can afford is a box. So that's what they've got here. But, uh, some live owls with night vision camera. Everybody, thank you to everybody whose names appeared here in our credits. Raiders and followers, moderators and subscribers, cheerers, and lurkers too, and regular viewers, chatters, question askers, enthusers, Supporters of paleontologizing one and all. Thank you so much for your support, for making this a fun stream. This has been my favorite one so far from here in the new office. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you again tomorrow. For now, let's go see some owls. I'll see you there, everybody. Take care. <laughs>